honorable members. Uh, I'd like to also welcome uh, the Deputy Minister, uh, Honorable Shamini. Uh, also like to welcome the Director General of the Department of First Moon Business Development, um, the CEO uh, of uh, CIFA. Uh, trying to check uh, Adam uh, and also other uh, senior managers of uh, the department and the entities, uh, the staff of the committee, staff of parliament, uh, also the media present. Uh, this morning we are getting briefing from the Department of Small Business Development uh, on their annual performance plan as well as the Recording in progress. The budget. Uh, at this stage, I'll ask Ms. Uh, Mantia to indicate the uh, members that are present and also if there are any apologies. Thank you, Chief President. Um, present in the meeting today, Chair, we have yourself, Honorable Mashodi, Honorable Bashoff, Honorable Dango, um, and Honorable Lunt. Um, we've received apologies from, um, we've got a sending apology from Hon Honorable Lansman and Honorable Matabula. And then we've also got an apology for apologies from Honorable Mamarehana and Honorable Brautusef. My co-committee secretary, um, Ms. Grace Tunizulu, she will be joining us via her phone because she's having um, challenges with her laptop. She, so I have an apology from her as well. Okay, no, thanks very much. Uh, let me also acknowledge the uh, presence of uh, the minister. She's uh, uh, locked in. Uh, good morning, the minister. And uh, also acknowledge uh, the deputy minister. Um, let me then immediately hand over to the minister uh, to make uh, her opening remarks. And then uh, she will then delegate it to the whoever will be then taking us through the the presentation on the annual performance plan and the budget. Over to you, Honorable Minister, Mafak. Thank you so much, Honorable, House, Honorable Chairperson, and good morning to all Honorable Members in the House or in this platform. Greetings to our entities and our departmental officials. Uh, Chairperson, as we have indicated, Today, we are presenting to yourselves on the work that we have committed to do in relation to our strategic plan, budget, and APP of the department for this financial year. Members. Uh, just a minute. I've just been informed that the, 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 our meeting is being streamed live. Uh, request if it's possible, if you can have your video on. Thank you so much. I hope this suffices for now. Honorable Chair, my apologies for that. Uh, um, yeah, no, that's fine. Thanks. That's fine. Thank oh, you so much. It's off uh, again. It's off again. Yes. I'm there not you. sure. It's now you, good. we can see you now. Thanks, 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 Chair. Okay. And Chair, as I was saying, we are coming to make a presentation to yourselves as the select committee. And of course, the DG will get into the details of the work that we, 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 we are talking about. We want to acknowledge up front that there's a bigger space that we really need to occupy as the department. And we believe that we can really, if we pay much attention and we capacitate ourselves, forge partnerships, we'll be able to really do more and meet uh, many of our targets. And of course, look at also our spending levels at an acceptable level that must translate to everyone that we have touched, seeing the value 
or the impact of the work that, that we are doing. Chairperson and honorable members, in, as we review this work that we're doing, uh, we are looking at it in a holistic manner and we also urge you to do so, to look at what the department and its entities are doing because we need not separate this as we say we are a portfolio that has implementing agencies that talk to the work that we do. It therefore helps us to get a better picture of what we have contributed overall uh, to dealing with the plight of, 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 of the SMEs. Honorable uh, members, in sharpening our delivery instruments, we are forging ahead with the merger of the two entities under our portfolio, inclusive of the CBDA that is under National Treasury. Members would then re be rem reminded that we were given approval to extend the major period for another 20 months due to the fact that we really needed to attend to some legislative framework that must enable all these entities to come together. Of course, at the center of it is the consideration of other critical elements to person, such as infrastructure integration, personnel, and all other aspects. As things stand, we are finalizing the appointment of GTAC to assist us in some of these work elements. Because if we put it in our plan, we ought to give confidence to yourselves that as we failed to meet those targets last year, we have learned this and therefore this is the progress and the capabilities to then make sure that we are able to deliver on what we had committed to do. We have started already with the measure process uh, as things stand, we have set up a joint operations forum where our department and the three entities meet to plan and discuss reports from the various work streams. We have appointed uh, interim boards as from the 1st of May, interim boards of, of CIFA and CEDA. And of course, that means we have new members and CEDA is led by Ms. Oliswa Dagu. Uh, and, and CIFA is led by Ms. Siwisa Simi is the name. If I were to just talk on the profile, Ms. Dagu, who chairs CIDA, is an accomplished award-winning entrepreneur in her own right and has a legal background and vast board experience. Currently, she's the CEO of Dagu Group of Companies, which has a property portfolio of about 1.4 billion rands. Ms. Siwisa is an equally capable and experienced executive with a strong background in economic development strategy. She brings to the portfolio extensive experience from international institutions, private sector research and economic advisory services. Chairperson, with your permission, I would like to hand over to the Director General to take uh, the committee through the presentation that was shared with yourselves. Once more, thank you for affording us an opportunity to come and present to yourselves. Thank you so much, uh, uh, Mafak, and also like to welcome uh, Honorable Lont and uh, Honorable uh, uh, Muimang, as well as the uh, two chairpersons of the entities, SIDA and SIFA. Uh, over to you, DG. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning. Uh, again, good morning to the Minister, Deputy Minister, uh, all uh, honorable members and uh, colleagues who are on the platform. Um, I will share the presentation. Uh, it's quite long, Chair, but I'll try and be very efficient in terms of time uh, so that we can cover everything uh, within the time allocated. Can I give you one hour, uh, G? Yes, yes, Chair. Yes, Chair. I okay. should be done within an hour. Thank All you. right. Uh, we, this is just the outline uh, of the presentation, presentation that we're going to cover. Um, I don't want to waste time on it. Um, and then the purpose is just to brief the committee uh, on our APP as well as the strategic plan uh, for the department. Chair, our mandate uh, is informed by these uh, policies and legislations. I just want to highlight one because the others have not changed. The first one there is the Businesses Act, um, which 
was transferred to the department um, in October 2020. And we are in the process of reviewing this. Like, this is a very critical piece of legislation because it talks to the issues around licensing and permits uh, of businesses. And um, there's quite a lot of interest around this piece of legislation. And the president did speak about it during the State of the Nation address. Uh, given its importance, as we believe that it will assist us in reducing red tape of which small businesses as well as big businesses have been complaining about. We also have the National Small Enterprise Act. We have a Section 3D of the Industrial Development Act because of CIFA, uh, which is still a subsidiary of the IT setting. Minister has covered uh, the fact that we are in the process of incorporating CIFA as well as the Cooperative Banks Development Agency into CEDA. These are other pieces of legislations and policies, the Cooperatives Development Act, the Cooperatives Development Policy, as well as the Cooperatives Amendment Act. We are also aligned with the National Development Plan, especially Chapter 3 and 6, the Medium Term Strategic Framework. We fall under Priority 2 in the MTSF, where we have to deliver on the upscaling and expansion of support to small businesses creating more jobs, as we all know that uh, jobs are really created by small businesses, inclusive economic growth, it's where transformation happens through the support of small businesses and all these other areas uh, that are listed there. And then we still have the integrated strategy on the promotion of entrepreneurship and small enterprises, which we recently reviewed uh, with the support of DPME. And uh, we've come up with the national a uh, um, master plan that I'm going to talk about in the next slides. Uh, we also have the integrated strategy on development and promotion of cooperatives, national informal business upliftment strategy, which informs our interventions when it comes to informal businesses, uh, where we include both the capacity building as well as the provision of the uh, instruments for our uh, informal businesses. Chair, the mandate vision, they have not changed. Uh, we still, the department responsible for leading and coordinating an integrated approach to the promotion and development of entrepreneurship, SMMEs and cooperatives, and as well as to ensure and enable legislative and policy environment to support their growth and sustainability. We always emphasize that we are leading as well as coordinating because we are aware that we are not the only department that is responsible uh, for the development and the support for cooperatives as well as SMMEs but we coordinate because there, there needs to be a leader in the space of which this is the department that is responsible for that. We do work closely with quite a number of government departments. Some of them have already entered into MOUs so that we can work together and ensure that whatever support we provide to small businesses uh, does not create confusion in the market. It's integrated, it's also complementary because uh, resources are available but are spread throughout various government departments as well as various um, government spheres. So it's important for us to play this role of ensuring that we lead and coordinate. Chair, briefly, in terms of uh, the economic uh, situation, we know that uh, we are still dealing with the effects of COVID, which disrupted uh, our economy. It led to a lot of uncertainty. Uh, I think we've recently seen the rising energy prices that are really um, causing a lot of disruption in the economy. Um, we know that as a country, we are lagging behind, in, you know, compared to the advanced economies when it comes to recovery from the pandemic. Our economic growth will show in the next slides that we are not expected to grow that much. As a country, we've seen uh, the South African Reserve Bank, they've started tightening the monetary policy by raising um, the repo rate. We still have uh, risks that we are facing as a country, electricity price, inflation load shedding higher oil prices, higher wage demands, and policy uncertainty due to developments. Fiscal policy, we know that the budget uh, is not that good. So we have to really tighten our belts and also that we do more with the little that we have. As I indica indicated earlier, South Africa, we can see there at the bottom, we are not doing even better than uh, Sub-Saharan Africa. You can see that in 2022, Sub-Saharan Africa is expected to grow at 3.7%, but we're only expected to grow at one point. 9% and next year it's not getting better. Uh, other countries are growing, we are not growing. Uh, we'll, uh, we are expected to grow at 1.4%. So we still have uh, serious uh, issues that we need to address as a country. But um, with the interventions that are being introduced, we believe that we can turn around the situation with, uh, in partnership with the private sector in particular. Chair, going straight to our 
priorities uh, going forward. Uh, I'm sure honorable members will remember that we introduced the Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Program, which is a program that is targeted towards uh, supporting uh, businesses that are based in township and rural areas, which was the first intervention uh, by the, uh, the, this administration to make sure that we have a dedicated program that deals directly with the support to township and rural areas. We'll accelerate its implementation. We've tried, but we need to do more as the minister was saying, and make sure that we accelerate the implementation of this intervention because there is a demand out there and we have to be responsive as government. Then in terms of creating an enabling environment, uh, we do have uh, two pieces of legislation that we are dealing with uh, this year. There is one that has been going on for quite a while, uh, the National Small Enterprise Act, uh, which we are aiming to introduce the Small Enter Enterprise Ombuds uh, Service Bill uh, through Cabinet. Uh, we, we have um, done uh, almost all the work that we are supposed to do from our side. For example, we are done with the Social Economic Impact Assessment. Uh, we have finalized the business case for the establishment of the Ombuds Service Bill. It has been okayed by Department of Public Service and Administration. There is one area that is missing is the legal certificate that we need to get from the Office of the Chief Judge Law Advisor so that we can take this bill back uh, to cabinet so that it can be introduced uh, to, to parliament. The challenge that we are facing there, uh, they have identified another clause that has nothing to do with the amendments that we are making this year, where they were saying that clause empowers the ministers to amend the primary act. And they are saying it's, that is not the responsibility of the minister. It should be parliament that is the only structure that is empowered to amend a piece of legislation. So we are in discussions with both the Office of the Chief State Law Advisor as well as the Office of the uh, State Attorney so that they can provide a proper advice in terms of how do we move forward because this, even though the clause that they've identified has nothing to do with uh, the Small Enterprise Ombud Service Bill, they are saying the whole act, then it means they cannot say this act is constitutional. So we are in those discussions with them trying to find a way because we have to take this bill to cabinet so that it can go to parliament. The SMMEs, they do need this ombuds office to assist them to deal with the challenges they are facing. Then they, I've spoken to the Businesses Act that we are amending this year to make sure that we create this enabling environment uh, for, for our small businesses and we introduce some sort of uniformity across the sector because uh, this act is implemented through municipalities and unfortunately they do things uh, differently uh, it depends on where you are in other municipalities they charge you 2000 rand if you are an informal business you want to get a license or a permit trade in other municipalities they charge you 500 rand so there needs to be this uniform uh, uh, approach in terms of supporting uh, uh, small businesses uh, we are in the process of finalizing smes and cooperatives funding policy uh, that will really change the way access to finance uh, is, is, is undertaken in, in this country. Red tape reduction program, which is a very critical uh, area. We are upscaling this intervention to make sure that we reduce red tape, especially at the municipal level, because they are, first, uh, they are the first port of call uh, for our SMEs and cooperatives. Localization policy framework and implementation program will continue to implement this where we are getting as many small businesses and cooperatives as possible producing and getting their products uh, listed uh, with uh, the retailers. Small Enterprise Manufacturing Program, which is an instrument that enables us to implement this localization policy framework, we provide both financial as well as non-financial support uh, and empowering our SMEs to have the proper equipment, machinery, as well as the expertise to produce goods that are of acceptable uh, quality. Then we do have the Youth Challenge Fund, which was launched by the minister towards the end of last year, where we are targeting young people uh, who want to start and grow their businesses. Uh, we provide them with dedicated support. We do work closely uh, with the National Youth Development Agency. Product markets, business infrastructure, we know this is one of the critical areas, especially for those enterprises that are based in township and rural areas. They do need infrastructure, uh, business infrastructure, so that they can operate uh, in, in, in areas, you know, that are conducive for them. They can also be able to receive uh, the, 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 their, their clients. So we are uh, having targets. I think we have targets of sub having 20 business infrastructure uh, uh, projects uh, set up by the end of the, of, the, of the term, of the medium term. 
if business viability is one of the interventions introduced to assist those businesses to turn around uh, and uh, upgrade in terms of the processes uh, given the effects of COVID because most of the businesses now have gone digital and uh, they've tried to adapt you know, their business processes to the current realities. Incubation centers, uh, Chair, is one of the critical areas. We need to expand this and make sure that these facilities are available, especially in the township and rural areas. We are doing this work through CEDA, establishing incubation centers and digital hubs. Uh, linking uh, our SMEs and cooperatives to the market through e-commerce platform, um, which is one of the interventions that we had to introduce uh, because of COVID. There are more uh, businesses that are moving you know, towards uh, e-commerce. Then one of the critical areas, which is also informed by uh, the guidance that we received from uh, the DPME through MTSF, that we need to make sure that at least 40% of our interventions must go to women-owned enterprises, 30% to youth-owned, and 7% to persons with disabilities. We are also in the process, Chair, which you ma must indicate that uh, we are getting closer to finalization the issue of the organizational structure. Uh, members might be aware that we are still operating uh, user utilizing a setup structure, but uh, we've gained a lot of traction uh, since the last two months uh, where the ministers of the two departments have met uh, to make sure that we get uh, this uh, process finalized. The um, minister has spoken on the issue of the small uh, business support entity. I'm not going to repeat that one, but it's a process uh, we've been given an extension until December uh, 2023 to finalize the incorporation of the two entities. Chair, this is just an indication in terms of our alignment of our intervention that we are not operating outside of government, we are part of government. There are specific outcomes that talk to the economic risk construction and recovery program priorities. Priority area five, macroeconomic interventions, those are our uh, uh, departmental outcomes, but on the far right, we have the specific indicators that talk to each and every uh, ERRP priority. So I'm not going to dwell much on it, but we are just showing here that as a Department of Small Business Development, we are fully aligned. We are also fully responsible for the implementation of the RRP together with other government departments who are not operating outside uh, of, 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 of government. Uh, priority area six, just to emphasize that the green economy, we know that this is the future. Uh, we do have a partnership with the Department of Forestry, Fisheries and Environment because we are not also claiming to be knowing all things. Uh, we do work we closely with these government departments that are sector specialists to assist us to deliver uh, on the targets. We do also have targets that talk to export promotion because we believe that uh, small businesses have to occupy the space even in the international uh, markets. Those are the targets that we put in our in our app to show that this is how we're going to do and then lastly there the bottom is the national integrated small enterprise development master plan implementation which we need to uh, make sure that we finalize as soon as possible cabinet approved that the department goes and gazet this master plan and um, uh, for public consultations for one last time because we did have consultations but we thought because this is a national master plan, it's not a Department of Small Business Development master plan. It's also not a government master, it's a national master plan. So we need to gather and make sure that those people that we're not able to reach uh, during our consultations, they do get an opportunity uh, to see the master plan to also provide input so that we take it back to cabinet for final approval. Then, Chair, we, these are, it's a further indication here of our uh, uh, interventions when it comes to ERRP. Um, we do have these uh, interventions, especially the, the first one there. What we're also doing, Chair, we are spending quite a lot of money, especially through CEDA uh, in supporting incubators. And we've, we've indicated earlier that we are planning to expand and get more incubators. It's important for us as a department to go back and look at these incubators. Are they assisting us to deliver uh, in terms of the mandate? Are they doing what they are expected to deliver on? We cannot just go and spend money and not monitor the impact. So we do have the target of ensuring that we do monitor and also report on the uh, incubators that we are supporting, but also uh, uh, um, introduce improvement plan when necessary. And the next one, I'm not going to repeat. It also talks to the work that I've spoken about, that uh, we have the SME Incorporated Funding Policy that is being finalized and all those other interventions that talk to the support to small businesses and cooperatives. And then, Chair, 
we we have um, some of these targets just here we are showing direct links between the medium term strategic framework as well as our interventions there are targets that we are responsible for as a department of small business development that we are leading in the mtsf there are also those targets where we are playing a supportive role for example, in the first one, Chair, we were, we were expected uh, through the MTSF to develop a policy framework and implementation program for SMEs and cooperatives. We've done that. It was announced as part of the um, as part of the President uh, uh, ERRP. Um, we are implementing that. Um, we're also in the process of uh, finalizing our master plan, as I indi indicated. It, all the other master plans that are uh, they are led mostly by the Department of Trade and Industry. They have to talk to uh, small and small businesses. How are small businesses expected to play a role in driving the economy, especially in those specific sectors? So uh, our master plan comes after the, all these other master plans because we had to sit and identify all these uh, opportunities for small businesses in the other uh, master plans. Uh, incubation uh, centers. Uh, this is one of the key targets I've spoken to that we are expanding this targeting especially the township and rural areas because that's where lack of infrastructure uh, has been identified and we have to make sure that we bring these facilities uh, to our township and rural areas. 10,000 youth business startups supported per annum while executing this work. As I indicated earlier, we also work closely with the NYDA, but uh, our entities in particular CIDA and CIFA are leading this work. Um, one of the interventions that we are introducing through the SME and cooperatives funding policy, we're saying the BFIs irrespective you know, of the size, at least 50% must go to supporting SMMEs and cooperatives. We are not um, thinking of saying, uh, if IDC, for example, they introduce an intervention and they talk about SMMEs, we go and complain. No, we're saying the mandate is too big. We have to work together. So they, are, they have bigger resources than us. So their money must also go to supporting SMMEs and they have been doing that um, uh, uh, recently. 100,000 cooperatives, small businesses and cooperatives supported by 2024. This is the work that we are doing. Uh, for now, it's only us and the entities. Uh, it's supposed to be the whole of government, but it's a struggle to get reports from various government departments. Only the Department of Labor that has come around and they are saying they are going to uh, uh, assist us with information, especially with the funding that they are dispersing through the Public Investment Corporation. A diamond waving flag. Extra bonus for the technician moment. Uh, can I be protected? Uh, can you please uh, mute your mic? Uh, whoever is uh, talking now. Uh, so thanks, Chair. Again, put their videos, I mean, their TVs on while they are in the meeting. <laughs> no, thanks, Chair. We we were also working closely with the uh, uh, National Treasury on this target. This one is indirectly linked to us, but we are playing a supportive role. Township economic profiles, uh, because National Treasury also realized that the investment that is made, especially uh, in the in the cities, you know, we, they must lead, uh, you know, economic growth in these areas. We're also supporting Department of Agriculture when it comes to uh, uh, the, especially the small scale farmers, uh, because agriculture, they do support them in terms of providing equipment. But on our side as a department, we do say this investment by government, it needs to be uh, protected by ensuring that these farmers, they run their, their, farm, their farm operations as businesses. So we do provide uh, business development support, but also we do engage with them when it comes to market access uh, for these small scale uh, farmers. Uh, there is also an indication there, Chair, where one of our targets is aligned to the National Annual Strategic Plan of DPME. Chair, I will try and be brief on this one as well, that we are working here <laughs> um, with our targets. We're just showing, Chair, our five-year targets on the far right. I'll just focus on that, that we're looking at it, at least having 1,000 products and services rendered by SMEs and cooperatives listed and procured because government is one of the biggest uh, procurers, so we need to make sure that at least 1,000 of these products and services that are produced uh, by SMEs are procured by government. SMEs focus local policy framework. I've, in the, uh, I've spoken to this target that we are implementing it. Um, 1,000 SMEs and cooperatives exposed to international markets. It's contributing to our work in the international uh, space. 
10,000 women-owned businesses registered on international platform. Here we're working with the International Trade uh, uh, Corporation. We're working with uh, EU, uh, where we've introduced the Sheet Trades that a platform we just launched uh, by the minister last month. Um, this is uh, the work that we um, take seriously because we believe that uh, women-owned enterprises need to get opportunities. So here, this instrument is just targeting women-owned enterprises. So if you are a man running a business, you won't qualify to participate in this, but you will qualify in uh, participating in other programs uh, that are targeted towards ensuring that SMEs are exposed to international opportunities. I've spoken to the next uh, target, which is the National Integrated Small Enterprise um, uh, Development Master Plan, which uh, is being uh, finalized, is gazetted currently, but we are finalizing it for uh, submission to cabinet for final approval. Um, I did speak to this one, uh, uh, Tiger Chair, that uh, every year we need to assess the impact of our incubation uh, program and make sure that it does assist us uh, in, in empowering our SMEs and cooperatives. SME support plan aligned with the district development model. This is our commitment chair that as a department, we also align ourselves with the DDM model because we believe that it will assist us to reach those areas that we have not reached, but also in ensuring that our interventions are not skewed towards those areas that are based uh, where it's easy to access support uh, the urban areas, but we need to have specific targets for rural and, and far flung areas. So we do have an SME support plan that talks to that. And we, as a department, also have what we call district champions, where different colleagues uh, from uh, uh, across the department are championing uh, certain districts. SMEs and cooperatives funding policy, uh, I've spoken to this one. 10,000 youth business startups supported per annum. This is a target that we are um, uh, ensuring that we achieve uh, by all means, ensuring that both CEDA and CIFA also play a role, because it's not just about accessing finance, but also business development skills are very important for to ensure that our SMEs, especially those that are owned by young people, are successful. 100,000 competitive uh, small business cooperatives supported. This is the target uh, on the MTSF because the competitive small businesses are the ones that are not just there for survival, but are there to make sure that they contribute in terms of economic growth as well as job creation. So we need to support those competitive uh, businesses as a department as well as government as a whole. And then 100,000 township and rural enterprises supported through our township and rural entrepreneurship program, where we are clear that uh, the money that has been allocated by government does go to township and rural areas. The implementation of the National Small Enterprise Act monitor, this is also an important area that I've spoken to earlier, uh, where we're still having those challenges in terms of constitutionality of certain provisions of the National Small Enterprise Act, but we are pushing to make sure that we do establish this ombud service because it will assist our SMEs to have this facility where they are having challenges with people who are not paying them on time, those uh, business as well as government when they change contract terms or you know during the the period of the execution of that contract they can have this facility to go and 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 uh, uh, lodge their complaints with and uh, because it's difficult for SMEs to access justice it's very expensive so this ombuds office is supposed to assist them uh, to to deliver to get uh, access to justice in a cheaper way. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, program one, a uh, target that one is very critical. We still need to maintain this unqualified audit, audit opinion for both financial as well as non-financial support, but also the expenditure in terms of the budget. We need to make sure that the money that is available to us by National Treasury goes to the economy. So we, we're not uh, planning to go uh, above uh, 5% in terms of uh, under expenditure. We also has to have to lead as a department in ensuring that the valid creditors are paid within 30 days. Um, also the issue of the database, uh, where, which is a platform that we first introduced during COVID. Uh, We're still developing it further because uh, we need to introduce new uh, dimensions to make sure that it does assist our SMEs to cut down in terms of uh, the red tape, but also they do access business development support in one platform. Action plan on ease of doing business, we indicating here, Chair, that uh, we are serious about ensuring that uh, red tape is reduced, especially at the municipal level. We are taking it at the district level because we want to make sure that the district municipalities are able to monitor and assist the local municipalities in the execution uh, of, of, of the red tape uh, reduction interventions. Chair, I will not uh, waste a lot of time, but I'll try and be very quick here. Um, just looking at time as well. 
Um, we this is program one, uh, which is mainly the ministry uh, office of the DG corporate management as well as financial management. We're a very small department, so we don't have, for example, a DDG responsible for corporate management. These are the targets, Chair. I've spoken to these ones: the unqualified audit outcomes for both financial and non-financial support. 100% of valid creditors must be paid within 30 days. Uh, in terms of the budget, I spoke to this one that we need to at least 95% uh, and above of the budget that is allocated to us must be dispersed. Uh, it must go to the economy. We also need to maintain the 10% vacancy rate in funded permanent post. Um, we also serious about ensuring that at least we have a minimum of 50% uh, female at an SMS level. So it's not just about the numbers in the department, but at a leadership level, we need to have at least 50% uh, female. 4,2% representation of uh, persons with disabilities. We are increasing these targets. Uh, next year, we need to reach uh, 7%, which is the MTSF uh, uh, target. Chair, here we are showing that uh, we are really uh, taking a giant step in increasing our public engagements because there has been those complaints that people are not uh, aware of the interventions that we have and they don't have access to information. Um, so last year we had a target of 24, uh, but the minister has, and deputy minister have been leading various interventions uh, going across the country, engaging uh, with small businesses, uh, cooperatives, uh, inclusive of the provincial as well as uh, local municipalities, so that when we engage with the SMMEs, they do get solutions to the challenges that they face on the spot, but also uh, we do come up with a plan in terms of how we're going to implement whatever uh, commitments we've made as a collective there. So we are increasing uh, the target from 24 and this year, 22, 23, we are going to 70, so it's more than double. Uh, the next one is the SME uh, uh, database where we're looking at integrating the SME business index to identify level of readiness and capability of small enterprises implemented because as government we've supported small businesses, but in terms of monitoring and ensuring that we see uh, the continuous growth of these small businesses over time. Uh, we've not been successful in doing that. So we are ensuring that we integrate this element uh, so that we can check the level of readiness because also this assists when it comes to access to finance because as government, the demand out there is around 340 billion in terms of a, a gap finance, finance gap. As government, we don't have those uh, uh, resources. Uh, so that's why we work closely with the private sector. And the private sector, they do look at the issues around credit scoring records uh, just to make sure that whoever they are funding, it's, it's, it's a business that is willing uh, to pay back uh, the money or is capable of paying back the money. They have paid back the money that are owed. It's one of the issues that was raised, Chair, by um, uh, the Banking Association of South Africa when we engaged them about the failure of the National Credit Guarantee Scheme. They said, no, some, um, they focus mostly on the businesses that are already their clients because at least they can monitor them and see that these people do have a capacity to pay back the money that is uh, they've lent uh, to them as, as, as uh, the banks. Program two, Chair, this program is mainly responsible for access uh, to markets. Uh, but product development support as well as value chain integration, those are the sub programs, sector and market development, uh, business information and knowledge management, because it's still critical for us to do research to make sure that our interventions are informed uh, by, by evidence. Ease of doing business as well as tape is located, access to market support to provide both domestic and international market uh, support. These are the targets, uh, Chair. Um, we targeting 250 products produced and services rendered by SMEs linked to the market. Um, we remember that I indicated earlier that we have a target of 1,000. Uh, so those are the targets uh, that we've spread throughout. Uh, we started implementing this target last year where we were able to get 238. So this year, which is 250. Uh, so by the end, 2024-25, uh, we should be above 1,000. And then we, we have uh, this target on ensuring that the women-owned enterprises in particular uh, are registered on the sheet trades at a platform because I must indicate that this is an international platform where uh, women-owned enter enterprises can go in and even access uh, market intelligence to know, you know, if you want to trade with a particular country, what is expected of the products that are coming from South Africa uh, to that particular country. So it does provide that uh, platform where 
uh, uh, women-owned entities can go and access uh, this information. Then 200 SMEs and cooperatives exposed, uh, this is our target for this year, exposed to international market opportunities where we are also accommodating um, uh, men uh, who own uh, businesses. They can also participate in these platforms. Uh, we've been doing most of these platforms uh, virtually because of COVID restrictions. We hopefully will be able to go back to normalities very soon so that businesses can go to these international uh, countries and also access these opportunities. Chair, I've spoken to this one a little bit earlier that the business infrastructure is very critical. I must indicate, Chair, that we are really getting support, especially working with the provinces, where they are also pledging their own resources, because we always say it doesn't help us as a national department to go and set up an infrastructure in a particular area and leave. Uh, someone has to make sure that this infrastructure is maintained. Um, you know, the, the issues around repairs are done. Um, so we do work closely here with other partners who will remain behind and then the municipalities are also on board so that they also provide the necessary basic infrastructure that has to support uh, these facilities. We also look at refurbishing existing facilities. So it's not about, you know, going and establishing a new facility. We do ref refurbish existing uh, structures that are underutilized. Uh, monitoring reports, I did indicate here, Chair, that is a critical target to make sure that we monitor our incubation support program, whether it still assists us to achieve what we desire. And then the business amendment bill, I did speak to this uh, in, uh, area. Um, this area is very critical, Chair, because the business amendment bill, it will be talking to um, the issues around permits, licenses, and we know that uh, lesson, drawing from the lessons that we learned when we were still part of the DTIC, back in 2013, uh, where the licensing bill, I'm sure some of the members will remember, it was withdrawn uh, and it never went any anywhere because there were quite a number of uh, uh, issues that were raised by the private sector in particular. So we are very cautious in terms of introducing this bill. We want to make sure that we reach a consensus uh, on, on, on some of the controversial areas, but we'll also push as government because we also need to lead when it comes to these areas, we need to create this environment, we need to negotiate certain things. So this bill definitely will have to also come through uh, the NCOP in particular and be tagged as section 76 because it does talk to uh, the, 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 the work that is done uh, through the provinces. The chair development finance, um, where we, it's a new area here uh, that we've introduced because we realize that access to finance is one of the critical areas and that we are driving, uh, those are the, sub-programs around uh, this uh, this area because we also believe that we need to continuously look at new innovative ways of offering uh, support uh, to small businesses. These are the targets, Chair. The first one is the SME and cooperatives funding policy that has to be approved. We're also planning to take this uh, uh, to cabinet. Also, uh, support to cooperatives. We're targeting 200 uh, this year, uh, increasing these over the years. We must uh, indicate uh, that we've been having some challenges around this area, but we aim to work closely with the sectors, especially other government departments who are also supporting cooperatives. You're also working uh, with other cooperative structures in the, in, the, in, the, in the country to make sure that we are able to really increase support uh, to cooperatives enterprises. That's the target on the township and rural enterprises uh, supported. We're looking at 20,000 this year, 30,000 next year, as well as 40,000 uh, the other year. Uh, these, all of these must lead to us being able to achieve uh, the target of supporting 100,000 uh, township and rural enterprises by 2024-25. Uh, customer customized sector program, we have a target of 900 uh, this year. These, this program, Chair, it does target, especially those uh, um, enterprises that are based in rural areas. We work closely here with the provincial uh, entities uh, supporting those, uh, especially women-owned enterprises that are involved in the creative industries. Uh, so we're targeting 900 this year, and next year we're looking at 1,000, and then the other year also 1,000. 10,000 new startups, uh, we have uh, this target over uh, 10,000 uh, going forward. Also the competitive uh, small businesses, uh, we're targeting 25,000 this year. We'll also be looking at getting 35,000 competitive uh, small businesses and cooperatives supported. These are the enterprises that are really need to assist us as a country uh, to, to grow the economy and also increase uh, employment. The last program chair is program four, enterprise development. 
uh, where most of our work around supply development is done. Entrepreneurship is also falling under this program. Also, the work that we're doing with the municipalities when it comes to local economic development also falls under this program. Uh, the first target there, Chair, is the finalization of the National Small Enterprise Development Master Plan, uh, which I indicated earlier that is gazetted and it, we're taking it back to Cabinet. Municipalities, we're targeting 20 to be assisted with red tape this year, date next year, and 40 uh, in the outer year. Um, here, Chair, this is a new target, assessment review report of SME regulatory impediments to reform approved by exco here chair we this target we are aiming at looking at each and every piece of legislation that has an impact on the uh, performance or, or yeah or on the operations of smes because they have been complaining that as government we come up with various pieces of legislation uh, that impedes you know their competitiveness as smes so as a department we are leading this process we're aiming to take this to cabinet because some of the pieces of legislation that are out there are not uh, from the Department of Small Business Development, they are from other government departments. So we need to take this to cabinet so that we can resolve the issues that have been raised uh, by small businesses. Chair, with your permission, if I can request so that I can also take a sip of water, we request the CFO to just uh, take the, 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 the portfolio, the select committee, so the apologies, uh, through the budget uh, over the MTF uh, period. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, uh, CFO. Uh, thank you, Chair, Honorable Chairperson, and uh, good morning to honorable members of the Select Committee, our Minister, Deputy Minister, DG, Chairperson, CEOs, and colleagues. Um, with your permission, Chair, if I may just put off my video to be able to, to, to sustain the my, my network on this end as I present. Okay, then continue, CFO. Okay, thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of the allocation for the department, we, as DG has already as, uh, presented on our performance, the resources that we have been allocated for the three uh, four programs that we have, the three core program and one administration, for the financial year 22-23, we have been allocated 2.563 billion, uh, which uh, over the MTF is 7.8 billion. Um, in terms of the proportion of the allocation of the budget, administration takes up 5.25% of that. Development uh, sector market and development takes up 5.3%. Development finance takes up the bulk of our resources that are allocated over the MTF at 52.6%. Enterprise development taking the second largest portion of that uh, allocation at 36.79 or 36.8%. The same allocation in terms of um, economic classification chairperson and committee members. Um, <clears throat> Compensation of employees is allocated at 190 million for the 22-23 um, financial year, and over the MTF is 657 million, and goods and services is 63 million, and over the MTF is 191.3 million. Uh, payment for capital is the least, which has 4.7 million um, for the 22-23 financial year and 14.8 million over the MTF whilst transfers and subsidies take up the bulk of our budget with 2.3 billion and six, just under 7 billion over the MTF. Uh, compensation of employees takes up 8.4% of the total allocation, goods and services just under 2.5%, um, payment of capital asset when 0.19% um, of our budget, transfers and subsidies, uh, just under 89% of the allocation, which is the biggest of the four items that have been listed. Next slide, please, uh, DG. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, and and in, 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 in fact, we have already spoken to the projected expenditure over the MTF in that we have provided from 2018 up until the 24th, 24-25, and uh, one would notice, Chairperson, that our uh, average expenditure over the previous years from 2018 to 2019 had been 
97.9% of the allocated budget. Once the growth of the MTF, which is 22, 23 to 24, 25, is 1.5% over the, the, the three years mentioned. Um, the next slide, please, uh, DG. Uh, in terms of the project ex projected expenditure over the MTF for goods and service, uh, compensation of employees, goods and services and capital, we are still seeing an upward curve in that we, in 2018-19, uh, in terms of compensation of employees, we had spent 133 million and 1920, 137 million, had a slight dip in 2020, 2021 uh, of uh, 134, but uh, in, in 2021, we had projected to spend 155. And in terms of the actual uh, expenditure for 155, when we come back to report, the committee will realize that, in fact, we spent uh, slightly lower or much lower than what we had anticipated for the 21-22 financial year. However, projected for 22-23, uh, we have been um, allowed to reprioritize funding with the permission of National Treasury to increase our compensation of employees from, a hand, from about 155 to 190, 220, and 246 over the MTF. We will be, we are, or we are hoping to increase the number of, um, or the establishment or the headcount in 22, 23, uh, to a point that we will be increasing the number to 300 plus in 2024, 25 financial year. Currently we're sitting at 209 uh, chairperson and committee members. Goods and services in terms of our spending, on average, we have been uh, in the 18, uh, 18, 19 financial year, we had uh, 73 million, which has been decreasing gradually. 61.5 million in 1920, 48.7 in 2021, which is the year of our COVID, where most activities that would have consumed or required goods and services to be spent on were curtailed, such as traveling. Um, we, we had reduced in, uh, expenditure on other items that would have related to um, officials being in the office full time. Um, 21, 22, we had also hoped to uh, go back to normality, but we also had to reprioritize some funding from that 75.8, as we will be reporting in future dates if we're invited. The goods and services as it reduces to 63, 62, and 55 is on the basis that we reprioritize some of the funding in goods and services towards COE that you see increasing from 21, 22, from 155 to 190 for us to be able to afford the structure that we are still in the process of consulting with DPSA because we didn't have funding for some of the critical posts that we had uh, identified in the department. Uh, in terms of capital assets, our spending is more or less around five, four million per annum, and we are not anticipating to have drastic uh, changes in that space. Um, the next slide, which talks to the projected expenditures uh, as well uh, as well as the MTF allocation over uh, uh, over the years, relates to transfers and subsidies. Here we started off at a low of 1.2 billion during 1819, increased to two, just under two, or uh, just over two billion, and the amount has been um, going up and down, but steadying at two billion chair. And most of this money <coughs> is. Uh, in fact, we received some funding from um, National Treasury where we were able to reprioritize funding that would support uh, or help us to be partially responsive towards the COVID pandemic that we, 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 we all experienced in 2020, 2021. But some of the programs such as our TREP programs, we have been able to sustain uh, or convert into sustainable or permanent products. Uh, in that we moved away from having blended 100% um, grants as a department or mainly 100% grants as a department towards moving towards a blended finance. And most of these uh, programs are implemented by CIFA on behalf of DSBD as well as CEDA uh, from uh, non-financial support. 
the next slide that talks to um, what I've already spoken to in essence is that COE, we have been spending uh, on average 90.9% from 1819 to 21, 22. Uh, our budget in terms of growth from 22 to 23 is about 16.1%. Uh, our vacancy rate of uh, committee members through UCHA percent remains high uh, due to the organizational structure that is being finalized through consultation with DPSA, as well as the current moratorium on the filling of some of the posts until the structure is finalized. Our goods and services expenditure on average has been from between 18, 19, and 21, 22, hovering around 95.8%. Uh, and we have had a budget reduction, as I have indicated previously, that we have reprioritized funding towards uh, enabling department to support uh, afford uh, the some of the critical posts that we require for us to be able to uh, achieve the objectives of the department. And our major cost drivers currently are office accommodation, travel and subsistence, computer services, audit costs, as well as communication costs, and more so in data costs because of remote working um, for most TSPD uh, officials. Capital expenditure, 18, 19 to 21, 22, we have been spending around 88.7%. The growth rate in that spend uh, and in the budget being 4.9%. And our main cost drivers in that space, uh, computer equipment, office furniture, um, leases on uh, tools of trade, which is our cell phones, as well as the printing equipment that we have, as well as procuring of uh, ministerial uh, vehicles as and when there's a need to purchase one. Uh, next slide, DG. Revenue, we are not very big on revenue as GSPD. In, in, in fact, most of the revenue that we generate is um, from the um, interest that we generate from the transactions that we handle for third parties, commission on insurance premiums. Uh, the biggest um, um, transaction that we, we, we would have had is uh, of, 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 of that 20, the, the big jump of, 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 of 23 million was when we had to receive funds from CEDA that were being surrendered back to National Treasury. Uh, occasionally when we have uh, vehicles that are no longer, that we would have re declared redundant, we would also sell uh, as the department. Um, the slide that follows chair is how our, our allocation is broken down in terms of the current programs or the trap, uh, um, the, the, such as your trap, how CEDA receives and the program that we have implemented but through CIFA, which is our blended finance. We also converted our cooperatives incentive scheme into cooperative development support program. We used to have what we call the, the the, the, the informal business support program that we have now converted into product markets or safe shared economic infrastructure uh, uh, program into uh, product markets. Uh, but we always had the craft customized sector program where we, in, we engage with um, provincial agencies to assist us in supporting our crafters. I have reported that our transfers and subsidies are uh, allocated 2.3 billion for the 22-23 and just under 7 billion over the MTF. And committee members will note that our TRAP, which is our Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Fund, uh, takes up 41.9% or just under 42% of that, which is the 953 for 23, uh, 23, 23, 22, 23 financial year, and 2.9 billion over the MTF. Uh, CEDA, which is our one of the implementing agencies that we are responsible for, is allocated 884 million of that budget, and 2.7 of that over the uh, billion over the MTF, which is 38.9 percent. Blended finance takes up 290, just under 296 million of the allocation in 22-23, and 827.3 million over the MTF. The CSDP, as we call the corporate development program takes up 76.9 million in 22-23 and 219 million 
in the over the MTF, which is 3.1% of that allocated 6.9 billion. Uh, product markets um, picks up 83.3 million and 255 million over the MTF, which is 3.7% of allocation. And lastly, craft customized sector program, which we call the CSP, takes up 16.6 .6 million and 35.5 million over the MTF, which is 0.5% of the allocation. Um, That last slide. Um, in terms of our allocation for programs uh, uh, in provinces, I'm not too sure if DJ, you want to take this one up or if I should just take it up. If you can proceed. Thank you, Chair. Uh, in terms of the, 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 the programs that are taken up on our behalf by CIFA, the value of approvals in the informal and micro uh, finance uh, committee members will know that there was 200 million and the uh, in terms of the in terms of the value of disbursement we're looking at 360 million uh, that we are anticipating for the 22 23 financial year and the number of smes to be financed or anticipated smes to be financed is 83,181, uh, and we're hoping to facilitate 85,449 jobs. Uh, whilst in the wholesale uh, SME lending, uh, we anticipate to have 450 million, whereas the value of disbursements will be 301 million, and we're hoping to finance 549 SMEs. Um, as well as facilitate 6,997 jobs in that space. The KCG or Kula Credit Guarantee, uh, we're anticipating to um, approve 250 million and have around 342 dispersed, um, targeting 623 SMEs, uh, facilitating 7,949 jobs. Direct lending. Uh, 400 million uh, anticipated uh, value of approvals while we're hoping to disperse 300 million with 178 SMEs benefiting whilst facilitating 3,873 jobs for TREF. Uh, 933 million um, approvals are anticipated whilst we're hoping that the 700 will be dispersed. Um, while supporting 350 SMEs and facilitating 700 jobs. And um, uh, through you, DJ. Um, thank you. I thought you were gonna take the seat as well, are you? Okay, Chair, it's fine, I can uh, proceed. Chair, this okay. is the allocation of uh, CEDA. We know that uh, this year, 22-23, we are dispersing 876 million uh, to CEDA. Um, it's broken down the, you know, township rural informal businesses, they get the biggest chunk, is 51%. And then business competitiveness and viability program, it gets 244. And then uh, administration, as we know that CEDA also has provincial and regional offices. Uh, they were spending 182 million, which is 20% of the budget that is allocated to them. And then Chair, there is a breakdown there in terms of the provincial costs uh, per province. Uh, we start with the operational cost, uh, the first uh, column there in that bottom uh, table, and then incubators cost per province, because we still do support the incubators that uh, we have approved and they uh, are operational. Because if we do uh, disengage and in terms of providing support, we might lose the influence in terms of directing uh, these incubators to support a specific uh, area. So there is this uh, cost per annum uh, per, per, per province or per incubator. Uh, total cost per province, and you'll see that, that uh, the biggest the province uh, for now is for this was Natal, where 14 5 percent of the budget goes and followed by the Gauteng, which is 13.5 percent, uh, followed by Western Cape, 13.2 percent, as well as Eastern Cape, 13.1 percent.
and then chair. This is the breakdown in terms of the, the budget. I think we have spoken about uh, this area, but we're also highlighting here the shortfalls in terms of the budget. For example, on the, the first one, we had uh, the youth startup. We have 10,000 uh, businesses that we are targeting to support. So we have to always reprioritize in terms of the existing budget uh, to meet our targets of having 10,000 uh, youth-owned businesses supported. Uh, so there is a shortfall there because if we reprioritize within the, our own existing instruments, some uh, businesses or some interventions would not be, be supported. For example, for this year, 204 million, given the demand uh, that we've seen, we had also reprioritized, for example, one of the programs called the Gazelles uh, programs, program. Uh, we reprioritized that uh, program to a, a youth uh, a, a support uh, instrument. We have 29 million that is allocated there, 30 million, 31 million. So these um, targets in terms of the required that we've put there, we've learned from the lessons uh, since the opening of the Youth Challenge Fund uh, in, in November last year that uh, the demand is quite high for this instrument. So those are the projected uh, requirements. CIDA, CIFA, this, the, the, the major, uh, as Minister indicated, we're getting GTEC to assist us in finalizing this major. We do have a, a cost of six million that uh, GTEC will be charging us to assist us with all the processes, the due diligence, uh, the, um, the, the, the business case finalization, et cetera. Those are the things that we need to incur, the cost that we need to incur to get uh, this uh, incorporation of CIFA and CBDA into CIDA finalized. Establishment of the small enterprise uh, ombuds uh, office. Um, this one, we had been guided by DPSA that we need to make it partially part of government uh, at the start so that it can be properly incubated before it can be a standalone uh, service because this enterprise ombuds office has to be independent of, of government because we know that government sometimes they do not pay as a minimum time. So they will be approaching the same ombuds office. So if it's um, rooted within government, it might be difficult for it to uh, uh, deliver on its mandate. So we have been advised that we need to incubate it and make sure that it becomes this independent uh, office uh, uh, going forward. So we are starting at 3.5 million, uh, which is not funded. We have to reprioritize from the existing funding to make sure that the Ombuds Office is established. Chair, this is just a quick uh, rundown in terms of uh, CIFA's uh, budget. Uh, CFO has touched on this one that most of the budget, especially from the Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Program, uh, goes to uh, CIFA as they are the ones that are providing financial support. But also this is very important because um, it assists in ensuring that there is no confusion in the market. We are not competing with our own entities. So if you need financial support, you know that you have to go uh, uh, to CIFA. But CIDA also does uh, support uh, the, um, the, the, the same enterprises with non-financial support. Uh, CIFA, because of uh, the fact that it's still under IDC, they do get an allocation. Uh, through the MT, the, the through the DTIC, uh, and it goes via IDC and then goes to CIFA. They have 392 million over the MTAF. Um, we see there that there is a target uh, for for CIFA to reduce the cost to income ratio, uh, 80 percent, 87 for now, 80 in 2024, and then going down to 76 percent, so that most of the money that gets to uh, CIFA goes to really supporting and not uh, 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 covering the cost uh, of, of CIFA. Um, CIDA, um, the budget we've seen, Chair, uh, that uh, it will continue to decline for the next uh, three years, uh, which is something that we are not happy about, uh, but it's something that has had to be done by government to make sure that there are some savings and money can be redirected to other uh, interventions. But as a department, we are not saying we're holding our hands, we are still fighting and uh, also uh, uh, entering into these partnerships with the private sector so that they can also bring their own resources uh, in the space of supporting small business uh, 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 initiatives. We also indicating chair that this reduction in budget will also have an impact uh, in terms of our targets that we need to revise uh, downwards. Um, but for CIFA, we had increased given the money that we also transferred to them. Uh, their budget has been has increased uh, significantly. 
um, they will uh, see that they will be affected by the budget uh, cuts, uh, as I indicated in the earlier slide. Chair, in terms of our interventions, especially at the provincial and district level, I indicated earlier that the minister and deputy minister have been leading these uh, interactions going to all provinces. We try to cover all districts, but it might not be possible for us to reach each and every district, uh, but we've covered as many districts as possible. We've covered all those provinces there. We've also, during April, as this presentation was prepared in April, we had covered uh, Western Cape, uh, 20 to 22 April, we've covered uh, quite a number of areas in Western Cape. We also uh, covered Northwest uh, last week. Uh, so this week it's Limbobo and then the last province will be KZN. And these are very critical chair because we go together there with the province. We also go with the municipalities and the issues that are raised by small business. Sometimes they talk to service delivery issues. So the province as well as the municipality, they are there to respond to those issues so that whatever we promise or whatever we, are, whatever we commit to do in terms of supporting small businesses, we are able to go back and report. So in six months time in age and every province we're going back uh, to take up those issues that have been raised and monitor in terms of how far we've gone in ensuring that we respond to those uh, uh, issues. It's not just about talk shows, but we want to make sure that whatever is being raised is responded to by by uh, by by the uh, by government as a whole, including our uh, uh, municipalities and province. Chair, this is just an indication of the distribution of the support. Uh, that we have so far under TREP, for example, uh, in, during 2021-22 uh, financial year, this is the, the spread in terms of where most of the money has gone. Um, you will see that, that uh, in, in terms of the, the amounts, um, uh, Limpopo is leading, um, followed by Gauteng, um, and then followed by the Western Cape. Uh, but in terms of our DDM model, we are trying to make sure that these things, they don't remain the same like this. Uh, we do go to other provinces and we have specific targets uh, for various uh, district uh, municipalities. In terms of the IMEDP informal and micro enterprise development program, which is targeted towards informal businesses, this is the distribution so far uh, that we've undertaken during this last financial year. Uh, we'll be continuing uh, with the interventions by reprioritizing funding from other areas to also go and cover these other provinces that were not covered uh, during the 2021-22 uh, financial year. Chair, the last slide here, we are recommending um, that the select committee uh, adopts the 2022-23 annual performance plan of the Department of Small Business Development. Chair, as indicated earlier, we have the CEO of CIFA in here and some colleagues from the entities, they will also assist in the uh, handling of the questions. Thank you very much for the opportunity. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Minister. Uh, thank you very much, Tichi and the CFO uh, for the briefing on the APPs and the budget. Um, it's time now for honorable members to ask questions. Uh, can we have, uh, I don't know who's the Zoom user. I believe that's Mr. Lon, that's Honorable Lonchi. Oh, okay. <laughs> honorable Lord, sorry. Honorable Django. Yeah, sorry, I uh, donated my laptop after smash and grab, so I'm talking oh, between my other devices. Um, <clears throat> the, the, when did this department got created, we raised concerns, and it was a collective concern about the, the committee that aren't we duplicating work that can be done or used to be done by, by other departments. And, and the department came in and gave a lot of reasons and answers as to why they are needed. And then we said, the, the measurement tool at the end of the day will be how you contribute to job creation in this country. Because we've, we compared it to other emerging economies where um, SMMEs contribute upwards of 80% of uh, the economic activity and job creation. And we said that is what we need. We need this department to facilitate that we get into that direction. And every single year, we then raise the issue and say, but there's that, tool, that measurement tool of how you're addressing the growing um, 
unemployment rate in this country is you are shying away from that as a department. And we see an ever-increasing salary bill um, for this department, but we do not see the actual outcome. But even if you go to each of the slides and you do the measurements, I mean, the department comes and brags about jobs that's facilitated but I am pretty certain if we're going to delve down into each one of those, many of it is people that have already started it. And the department then comes in, gives a small amount, and then claims that as a success for the department. I mean, transfers and subsidies in to totals almost 90%. So in other words, you spend 10% um, employing staff, hiring officers um, to get people, warm bodies there, and the 90% you just give out the money. So that's just as what my father would say, listen, um, here is a one million. Make sure that you look after your brothers. And I just give all of them um, half a million each, and I sit back and I, and I take a little bit for myself and I just leave it. And I don't do any of the other follow-up. I don't see that that money is growing. That money is um, invested to make sure that not continuously a handout that's needed. And that is my big, big, big gripe for this department, that you want us to support this now, but it is not working. The, I'm, I'm going to just, one thing that I saw when you flagged the supporting the youth. Um, let me just get back to my notes, sorry. There's a, there's a um, 10,000 youth businesses that should be supported. There's a number that's basically sucked out of the air. Um, you say your ideal amount that you want, um, if you get your, your wish list, you now lamented the fact that you not, do not have enough money. But even if you do have enough money, it basically comes down to about 24K per youth business that you want to support. Um, now, in some areas, 24K, if you break that down over a year, it's basically 2000 a month. That might, might work in some areas. But in most areas, that will not work. That will not be a sustainable business. And that's even on the, the broader wish list or the, um, yeah, the, 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 the Rolls Royce campaign you want to roll out. And we, Chair, you've been on this committee now for a while as well. We've raised this year in and year out, and I'm, and I'm concerned that we as a committee are not being a lot harsher on this department in the actual outcome. Because I don't mind if you don't show an income. I mean, that's not what this department was there originally for. But what should be measured, again, is how you ensure that National Treasury has more tax-paying people um, entering the fray, but we are sitting with an ever decreasing tax base instead of a growing tax base, and this department that's supposed to help facilitate that is just failing dismally. And we have put forward constructive solutions on how we can get red tape for small businesses removed, but then because it comes from an opposition party, it they get disregarded out of hand and. Business as you. Are you still there, Honorable Launch? Increasing wish list and an ever increasing expenditure um, by the department on their own internal warm body, but you don't see that um, translating into actual successes. And the successes that was achieved. Please understand me that I'm not minimizing that. But if you look at the, the crisis we are facing in the country, doing it the same way as you've been doing it since the inception of the department is not going to cut it. And this is just doing the same thing over and over again, a tick box exercise, and we are heading for a cliff. It is, it is what's going on in the country with the unemployment just growing up or increasing and 
this department is not pulling their weight, not contributing. And the question that you asked right at the beginning, and it should still be asked, is, is it worthwhile? Because what you are doing now, everything that what you are doing now can be done as a subsection in another department. And uh, that's what I'm pleading to you as well that needs to make sure that we hold accountable. We, we need to step up on this and um, ask whether this is still the department that adds value or you're just saying it's another year, we're going through another cycle. But that's for now. Thank you, Jim. Thank you so much, uh, Honorable Lont. Uh, Honorable Dango, if you can also put your... I know... Uh, Honorable Lund has some challenges with the uh, device. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, Chairperson. Chairperson, uh, and this is a question to the Minister. The question of the state guarantees for COVID, the banks did not advance very much of that. But the misrepresentation by in the press and by other entities is that, that 500 billion was lost which is not correct. Most of that money was in guarantees that was not advanced by the banks. And I think we should have a campaign saying quite clearly that this is the position and not use this as a political campaign. For some, I think what to want to want to create insurrection within the country. Uh, my question then is on the, what, what is their association and involvement with the African Free Trade Agreement, uh, particularly in the areas of agriculture. The question of district champions, can they please send me the list of the district champions in the Gauteng province so I can engage with them? Um, Chairperson, the question of unqualified orders is an important thing, but I think Having listened to Honorable Lon, I think we need to look at the question of performance audits. Unqualified audits is one thing, but performance audits would be another thing. Has the Auditor General actually undertaken performance audits? And if we looked at performance audits, so that we actually can look at, at facts and figures when we're talking about that. The question of blended finance, who are the partners that they're blending with in SAFA? The, the transfer subsidies of 89%, um, where does that in fact go to, if we can just get a breakdown on that? The capital assets are flat throughout the years, so I'm not too sure, I just need an explanation on that. And on CEDA and IDC, is IDC acting as a wholesale funder and what is the margin? that IDC charges to see that and other entities where they're actually advancing money to. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Dango. Honorable uh, Boshoff. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, most of the issues have been addressed, but I would just like to find out as well with regard to fundings. Um, what is the possibility that one could go out and do oversight at these businesses um, to see for ourselves how the funding has been utilized and has it been beneficial? The other thing that I would also like to see is that we get a six monthly report from the department um, that they've generated from these businesses that have benefited from money given to them by government. Then I'd like to know how the department has been affected with the issuing of tenders after the directive note given by National Treasury. And then we get to the informal traders. Chair, we all know informal traders have been left to their own devices. The environment that they um, work in is not conducive. And I'd like to know from the department if any engagement is taking place um, with local municipalities to see how they can be assisted, especially in light of COVID-19 now, these people do not have access to any ablution facilities, they don't have running water, and this is a health hazard, a huge health, health hazard. 
Then I'd also like to know um, the president at Sona, at a Sona address, said that a red tape unit would be established. What discussions have taken place between the department and this red tape unit to see where they are going to start um, addressing the legislation that's impacting on small businesses? Thank you very much, Chair. Thank you very much, Honorable uh, Kosov. Honorable uh, Muimank. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chair. Uh, good morning, uh, Honorable Members. Chair, the, uh, the, 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 the fact that uh, we are midway through the the medium term strategic framework uh, and uh, uh, almost eight, 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 eight years away from, from, from 2030 targets of the National Development Plan are more uh, interested in getting uh, a, a response uh, to to uh, the role uh, uh, the role that the SME is carrying itself towards driving economic growth because uh, uh, from the national development plan it is expected that the it is expected that the that we need to 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 to, to ensure that uh, our target is met uh, to be able to to drive uh, economic growth uh, growth and uh, uh, unless drastic measures are undertaken to improve the support of the SNMEs, we will not be able to meet our target. So I'm more interested in terms of what drastic measures are we taking to ensure that uh, we. We uh, support the, the SME to be able to turn the situation around. I'm raising this point, Chair, uh, because uh, uh, of a realization that indeed uh, we need to grow and expand the SMEs uh, with a view uh, to contribute to, to a new growth trajectory as advocated in the in the economic reconstruction and recovery plan. Uh, but more than that, uh, our, our belief that uh, a healthy small business sector uh, is indeed a prerequisite to have a growing uh, economy with high employment opportunities, uh, uh, which explains why the reconfiguration in terms of uh, giving us particular particular emphasis on the on the, on, on, on the role of the, the small business development department. Uh, I see in terms of the the program uh, that deals with the, the ease of business, the ease of uh, of doing business. Uh, the budget, the budget, the budget is, uh, I think, a uh, sub program three uh, and uh, and uh, and uh, uh, program two. So, program three and uh, and uh, uh, program two. Uh, the we wish. Specifically targets the, the reduction of the administrative and regulatory burden of doing business for SMEs and the and the uh, the budget program uh, is also decreasing uh, uh, by two point eight. Uh, so. 
giving the impressions that the president has placed in terms of uh, the uh, the need to confront the red tapes. Uh, are we sure that uh, the the amount of uh, budgetary allocation that we are putting into this sub program will enable us to be able to 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 to, to support the initiative from the president? Uh, because the understanding is that the the uh, directives has been identified as a key inhibiting factor in terms of in terms of the the working environment for the for the SMMEs. The the, the the third point chair relates to to uh, program program four uh, under enterprise development. This program, uh, as correctly pointed out, uh, amongst it, it has a, a CIDA. Uh, the expectation is that the department must be able to provide leadership uh, in terms of policy making uh, to, to its entities. Uh, but one gets the sense that uh, that uh, CIDA has its own, has its own challenges with regard to to uh, the, the the space, uh, which amongst them is the is the other other agencies assuming the CIDA's mandate. Uh, and mind you, uh, uh, the transferee consumes. Uh, the, the bulk of the of, 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 of the transfers and uh, uh, it also talks about the introduction of new and realistic targets and programs by the departments with limited resources which uh, illustrate a sort of uh, a dichotomy or the entity and the department by passing each other uh, but also it talks about the the competition with other uh, business development entities at provincial level, the NYBA, uh, whether it is the Houting Enterprise uh, Propeller, whether it is the Local Economic Development Agency, whether it is in Kumbalanga Economic Development Agency. Uh, I'm not sure where, with my province, uh, in Veda, whether it's still the same situation. But I think it becomes important to get a sense in terms of uh, the role that the department is, is playing in terms of addressing these challenges because uh, uh, it, it becomes important that uh, uh, these challenges are, are addressed uh, because one would expect the, this entity to, to ensure that it toes the line in terms of uh, the policy direction that the, that the department is providing. Uh, other than that, the, the what are the lessons that the, I think from the the GDM uh, model visit that uh, that was alluded to uh, by the by the team uh, that was led by the minister. The fact of the matter is that uh, most of the economic activity is taking place in bigger province. Is uh, that will be uh, how it is, that will be Kwazulu Natal that will be. Uh, Western Cape. Uh, is there any targeted approach that could be that could be uh, a design to ensure that uh, uh, we, we we sort of turn the situation around? Thank you, Chair. Thank you so much, uh, Honourable Mainak. Uh, followed by Honourable Mushodi. Uh, thank you very much, Honorable Chairperson. Good afternoon and greetings to Honorable Minister, Deputy Minister, and Honorable Members. Let me start, Honorable Chairperson, by welcoming the presentation for, from the department. Uh, my first question, Honorable Chairperson, is what are the challenges presented by the capacity of staff establishment under Program 1 in increasing the full print of the department programs across all provinces, Honorable Chairperson. That's number one. Number two, Honorable Chairperson, 
What is the arrangement on the reduction of red tape by department currently given that the red tape reduction unit has been moved to DPME department? That's number two, Honorable Chairperson. And number three, Honorable Chairperson, my question is, what is the plan of the department in ensuring that capacity is developed to the rural and township entrepreneurs under TREP program so that they can graduate from informal traders to medium-sized businesses? Honorable Chairperson, that is my third question. The last one, Honorable Chairperson, I just want to check, is the department able to determine their contribution of SMMEs and cooperatives to decent employment in employment numbers? That's number four, Honorable Chairperson, for now. Thank you very much to allow me to ask this question, Honorable Chairperson. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, earlier, I saw the hand of uh, Honorable Aplin. I don't know if he's uh, still connected. Thanks, Chair. Uh, let me apologize for the video, but uh, also I'm um, Are you still there? Uh, uh, yes, we've lost, Chair. We've lost you for uh, a minute. Uh, for a minute, I'm so sorry. Uh, no, Chair, I think I'm mostly covered okay. because so, I was going to speak about the question of uh, uh, the rural economic development, which has been covered a lot by a number of speakers before me. And then uh, also the question of informal traders. Uh, I think Honorable Poshoff has covered me on that as well. So thank you very much, Chair. Uh, I so think much. I'm being covered. I will I just wait for the response. Follow -up. OK, thank you very much, uh, Honorable Apli. Honorable Moimang, is that a follow-up or hold hand? Oh, okay. It's an old uh, chair. All right. No, if you can uh, lower it. Uh, uh, just for me, I, I just want to find out. Uh, uh, firstly, we, we I think uh, we agreed that there was a call uh, for the establishment of uh, the small business uh, uh, de development department. Uh, you know, by uh, people of South Africa. Uh, because it was a, a, a just a program in the Department of Trade and Industry, and then businesses were complaining that there was no much focus uh, on small business uh, enterprises. Uh, so hence the call, and then our government uh, responded to that call. Uh, so we we don't have a, any problem with the uh, establishment of the department. I just wanted uh, to clarify that it's not a collective uh, a, a few uh, of the members of the committee. Uh, but also, this is uh, also in the uh, NTP that uh, most jobs will be created by small businesses. Um, but the, the, the challenge that we're having with the, with the strategic plan and APP, uh, perhaps uh, which perhaps the minister uh, uh, should be addressing, is this uh, issue of the uh, reduction by 6% uh, over the MTF period. Uh, it's a concern for a department that uh, is responsible for, for job creation because as uh, I indicated that uh, most jobs will be created by small businesses uh, and therefore uh, uh, more money should be put into the department uh, to, to ensure and also assist uh, the small businesses uh, to create uh, jobs. Uh, but if now... Uh, continuously there's a drop in terms of uh, the the budget that uh, should be allocated uh, to the department i just want also to find out uh, if there is any fund because there's this a uh, youth challenge fund uh, that uh, uh, in the in, in in the report uh, you referred to uh, uh, dg uh, whether there's this, any allocation uh, that has been budgeted for it, or is it the, the fund still in the process uh, of being established? Um, so if you can just say, say uh, clarify the, that aspect. But also on the issue of the red tape, I just wanted to ask, because uh, uh, 
I think uh, last year we, we, we indicated that there's some weaknesses uh, with uh, some uh, local government LEDs units. Uh, and that was, you confirm it, DG, uh, but also we raise it with the DTIC because also DTIC uh, reports uh, in this committee. They also confirm that there are weaknesses as they work with the uh, 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 small, uh, sorry, with the LEDs. Uh, they also observe that there's some weaknesses uh, with the LEDs in municipalities. Yes, I'm just asking as, as you are involved in this red uh, tape reduction program, uh, assisting the municipalities, uh, are you also assisting in, in strengthening uh, the LEDs, but also in, con in line with the uh, DGM uh, uh, processes? Um, I'm, I'm a bit worried about uh, the period that is going to take uh, for the businesses uh, amendment bill. I see that it will only come in Parliament in 2024, uh, 2025, 2025 will be, even 2024, uh, part of it will be a, a new term, which is, will be the seventh term. Uh, usually, if uh, the bill is not passed before uh, the end of the term, it then lapses. And then the following term, it starts from beginning. Now it means the department again must brief the portfolio committee of the NA uh, and then go through all those uh, processes of lawmaking and then goes to the NCOP. Uh, so I, I'm a bit worried because uh, as you were indicating, DG, there are issues uh, that uh, businesses are concerned with, issues of uh, issuance of uh, licenses and permits uh, that this particular uh, uh, bill is supposed to be addressing, but I'm worried about uh, the time period that it's going to take uh, to bring it to Parliament. It would have been good if it could be brought to Parliament before the uh, the end of uh, uh, the term, uh, so that uh, perhaps by 2024, 2025, you could be uh, starting with the implementation, uh, but also with the uh, 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 the small business, sorry, the uh, the small enterprise uh, uh, bill. Uh, it's not clear when is it, it's going to come to to parliament uh, in terms of uh, the processes. But also the ombuds uh, one um, uh, service. I don't know whether there should be uh, have its own vote budget vote uh, instead of uh, getting monies uh, from uh, the department uh, for the purposes of uh, uh, independence. Uh, if you can just uh, uh, clarify uh, uh, that aspect. And then uh, also the issue of the finalization of the organizational structure. I don't know if uh, uh, you have any time frames with regard to that, because we have been raising it uh, uh, over the years, the issue of the finalization uh, of uh, organizational structure where some position have acting the uh, DDGs. Um, yeah, so it would be good if you can just clarify in terms of uh, uh, the, the time frame. So we've, I think personally, I'm impressed with this uh, trap, uh, but we wish that we could have uh, more money uh, uh, put uh, towards uh, this particular program. Um, I managed to uh, deal, uh, to read uh, its, its uh, details in terms of how uh, it funds uh, the blend and finance part of it and the, the requirements in terms of uh, qualifying for it. Um, uh, but also I'm happy with the with the roadshows that uh, the ministry is taking so that uh, they hear uh, for themselves the challenges uh, and also the progress with regard to and the achievement uh, that the uh, small businesses uh, are, are indicating as they, they meet with them. Uh, I'm very impressed and uh, this should be uh, continuing. Uh, I know there's a program, uh, it has been indicated the provinces uh, that uh, the ministry is still going to uh, uh, to visit. Um, yeah, thanks very much. Uh, if we could, uh, I don't know, I don't know, uh, Minister, if you perhaps want to come first or last. Uh, I see there's a hand of uh, Honorable Musodi. Uh, I don't know if uh, he's, uh, he wants to make you. a follow-up. Okay. No. No, Chairperson, thank you very much. It's not a follow-up as such. It's my last, last question. 
if okay. you can allow me to ask this question before the department uh, respond. Uh, Chairperson, I just want to check, is any uh, uh, progress that can be reported by department and, and each entity rolling out funding support to businesses affected by social unrest on July 2021, affecting uh, KZN and Gauteng province? Thank you, Honorable Chairperson. If we can get any progress made by department and its entity funding support to the businesses affected by social unrest in July 2021, affecting KZN and Gauteng province, Chairperson. That is the last question that I forget to ask. Thank you, Chair, to allow me. Okay. Okay, maybe the department can just uh, give us an overview with regard to that. But if we need uh, more details, we'll have to invite the department specifically to come and address the committee uh, on that aspect. If uh, there will be more or detail, uh, final details with regard to that. For now, with, maybe they can just respond, uh, give us a broad overview uh, in terms of the progress. Uh, Minister, you'll indicate whether the DG and CFO should go first and uh, the entities and then come last. Th thank you so much, Chairperson. Yes, I would like to hand over to the DG and everybody else, then I will come last. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Mufak. DG? No, thank you, Chair. Uh, maybe the CEO of CIFA, uh, I think he is here. He can just cover quickly those because there are few and then we'll start as a department after the CEO. Okay. CEO of CIFA, Mr. Machama. Thank you, Chair. Um, let me start with the last one, Chair. We were given instruction that we will be given an opportunity as entities to come and brief the committee with regards to all those interventions that CIFA is implementing on behalf of the department, particularly the one that relates to the interventions that we implemented with regards to the, the riots in KZN and uh, and Gauteng. No, so actually, say, if, if, if I can just come in there, we, we, we had a schedule today for you and Sita, uh, but then there was some delay with regard to the tabling of the APPs. And I was supposed to meet with the department, I think, on the 4th of May. Uh, yes, but sir. then to accommodate uh, the department and to brief us on the APP, uh, we, we, are, we, we still go to meet with you. Uh, we, have, we decided that we'll shift it. Uh, unfortunately, we're going to we're gonna go for a constituency period uh, the whole month of uh, July. Uh, so you're, you'll be one of the first uh, departments or entities that will be meeting when we come back in August. Uh, on the same issue. So you don't have to go into detail, therefore, on, 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 on that particular issue. We'll deal uh, with it uh, in August. We're meant to deal with it today, uh, but we had to accommodate the department on, on the APP and budget. Thank you, Chair. Thank we, you so much. Just briefly on that one, Chair, we've received the, the applications, we processed them, and uh, to date we've approved about 237 million uh, for the applicants who are affected by the riots in both provinces. And uh, when we come back to the portfolio committee to report, we'll be in a position to indicate how many were in KZN and how many were supported in the province of Gauteng. Uh, but so far, we've approved about 237 million in that regard. Um, so coming to the question around the, the support to, to SMMEs, uh, and the work that we're doing jointly with the department. Um, we are chair, contributing a lot, I must argue, as a portfolio towards the support of SMMEs and job creation in the economy. For example, for the year that ended March 2021, which is last year, SIMFA alone, we provided access to finance to 74,000 SMMEs. And we will be reporting, Chairperson and Honorable Members, uh, quite soon, the performance for the year that ended uh, in March 2022, which is this year. The unaudited numbers indicate that we've supported this year close to 84,000 SMMEs um, um, in the economy. 
And uh, chair, we you can go and talk to any bank. There's no bank in this country that has provided that kind of level of support to SMMEs, not personal loans. We're talking about loans to SMMEs. Um, um, with regards to, to, to the issue of credit guarantee, it will appeal to are you, Sorry, are you able to put on your video? Please. Oops. Okay, okay. <clears throat> Thank you. I, am I visible? Thank you, Chair. Um, as, as I said, we will be reporting, Chairperson, the, the performance for the year that ended March uh, 2022 and the impact that the portfolio uh, just see for alone that we've actually driven with regards to the support of, of SMEs in the economy. The unaudited numbers are sitting at around 84,000, um, and they may increase because we're still waiting for some of the intermediaries that we do funding jointly to provide their, their final numbers. Then, Chair, coming to the issue of credit guarantees, the they, 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 they all appeal to the, to the House not to, to confuse the credit guarantee that was driven by the Treasury and the Reserve Bank and the credit guarantee that is driven by CIFA through cooler credit guarantee. The KCG credit guarantee, we work chairperson with almost all the bank, banks except uh, what we call um, um, Investec. And invent, invest like the, the, the client base is not even our target market. We're working with APSA, we're working with FNB, we're working with Standard Bank, we're working with um, NetBank. We're finalizing a relationship with Bitvest Bank, and we're also finalizing a relationship with Capital because through the acquisition of uh, one of the small banks, uh, boutique banks, yeah, I just forgot the name, they are looking now at entering the business or SMME funding space. And we're engaging them to have a, a credit guarantee, a, a, a relationship with them so that they can extend credit to SMMEs. That chair and members is one of our successful programs because it speaks to the intervention that government seeks to drive, i.e. crowding in the private sector to provide support to SMMEs and also accessing the balance sheets of the banks because the way our credit guarantee works is that we provide guarantees to the banks that extend credit to SMMEs, and they use their own balance sheet to lend to the SMMEs. And CIFA comes in to provide a guarantee on the back of those loans that uh, actually they've uh, extended to SMMEs. For the year, Chair, that ended uh, March again, 2021, we extended credit guarantees to these banks to the tune of approximately 201 million rents. And the banks in return extended credit to the SMMEs to the tune of 1.3 billion, which is a multiplier effect of, of 6.25. Now this year that ended in March, we anticipate that the multiplier effect of our intervention through the provision of credit guarantee will give us, a, that share is still not an audited number, approximately 6.38, 6.4 multiplier effect, which is higher than the multiplier effect that we, we actually achieved in the year ended March 2021. Uh, Chair, it's a program that we intend to roll out because it relieves the, the fiscals because we don't use the fiscals for this, for this credit. The banks use their own balance sheets to extend credit SMEs. But the critical issue on the credit guarantee chain members is what the Treasury didn't do when there is a bank is to put conditionalities. You can't just blankly give credit guarantee to banks without any conditionalities because they will continue supporting the people that they are supporting. With our credit guarantee, the rules are clear. There are conditionalities that we put for the banks to, to extend that credit to SMEs and predominantly a, a, a black owned SMEs in the main. And the banks are not resisting that. It's working, it's been working, and it's a program that we want to upscale as, as we rope in a, a, a more banks in the, in the, in the, in the space, Chairperson. Um, if, if there's a question, Chair, that I, 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 I probably missed, I will, I, will, I will request the, 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 the maybe the DG to, to remind me 
But the top of the mind, those were the questions that I felt I needed to, to, to tackle, Jefferson. Thank you. And the Youth Challenge Fund? The, the Youth Challenge Fund, Chair, is uh, one of the interventions that uh, we are rolling out. It uh, <clears throat> took off a bit slow. Why? When we rolled out or advertised the program last year, we received a CIFA approximately 2,570 applications from youth-owned entities. Um, one of the things that came up immediately was that only out of that 2,570, give or take, applicants, only 98 chairperson were complete. Complete in the sense that basic information like uh, financial projections that what are you going to use this money for? Basic information about the registration of the company with the CIPC, uh, 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 all that basic information. And uh, we, we then are working with CEDA to have these entities being to be assisted to complete the information. What is emerging here is that um, the, the youth is not financial, what to funding ready, if I may say. And what then that necessitated is that what we discussed with the CEO of CEDA was, of CEDA was that we need some form of a, an academy where we put these youngsters maybe through a program of three months, give or take, on business management. Basic understanding that to be able to access this money, you must have your entity registered with the CIPC, have your tax registration with SARS, um, 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 and have a bank account, because some of them, they use their own personal bank account instead of uh, using a business bank account. And the CIFA, we don't disperse funds to personal bank accounts because that now becomes a personal loan and not a business loan. So we are going to be putting that intervention uh, in place to assist these, uh, these SMEs because a majority of them, they are just completely not funding ready, Chairperson. And, and, and uh, we are now going to put those interventions in place. Um, I think the last time I checked, the chair, we were sitting, uh, that was around March, around 38 million uh, of approvals in that space. Um, and we, now that we've closed the year in March, the month of April and May, we've been chasing those applications and assisting those that are at least 80 to 200% to, to ready with the information. Uh, to, to, to help them to cross the line. So we will be reporting again checkers in progress when we are called back to, to the committee. But the critical issue is that we need some form of, you know, in government, they've got this course they call finance for non-financial managers. We need some form of a similar training on business management for this SMME so that they understand the basic requirements of setting up an entity. And also, we, we also provide the mentorship Post funding for those ones that were able to identify that uh, they they actually need mentorship for them to 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 keep their business running. Uh, thank you. So the CEO, there was two questions. The one about the ITC, whether they act as a wholesale lender, as well as the blended finance, uh, how it's okay. working. Okay. Okay. Thank you, DJ. <laughs> One, uh, 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 we as CIFA, not IDC, we are a wholesale funder. Maybe let me just give a brief background check. CIFA has got uh, mainly three uh, uh, funding streams. One is direct lending, where we fund clients or SMMEs directly, those SMMEs that apply directly to CIFA, that's one. Two, we've got the credit guarantee, which we do funding through the commercial banks, and uh, uh, other corporates, for example, Max Steel, who provides a, a steel to, to steel fabricators on credit, and the CIFA will provide credit guarantee to Max Steel in case those uh, steel fabricators default on the on the on the on their credit that Max Steel provides. That's two. Three, we've got what we call wholesale funding. Wholesale funding, we work with SMME wholesale funders. These are in the main, your entities, Chairperson, that provide funding to SMEs who get a contract in the mining houses, for example, to supply certain inputs, 
or get a government contract you know, tender or purchase order to, to, to supply certain uh, services or goods to government. Then we will provide uh, what we call funding for those, uh, those uh, intermediaries who in turn then provide or extend credits to those entities that service contracts and tenders. And then within wholesale, we've got intermediaries who are predominantly rural based. They provide or extend credit to women in the main, women owned entities uh, uh, in the rural areas. Some of them are involved in knitting school uniforms. Others are in the agri space. Uh, 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 and those are the people that the, the microfinance uh, uh, intermediaries then extend credit to. So the wholesale funding element is ours uh, as CIFA. And those are two main streams within the wholesale funding space that we provide um, 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 funding. Blended finance, uh, Chair, we are shifting now as CIFA the, the strategy of how do we extend credit to, to SMMEs, uh, particularly for those that we provide direct lending. Because we realize that particularly for startups, there is a challenge of, of, of working capital. And uh, in the main, if you only give these entities loans, you are increasing their gearing. And as a result, they struggle to meet their financial obligations. So the decision that the entity took with the leadership of the minister is that some of these entities or the loans that we extend to these entities must be blended with an element of credit and an element of a grant. What that grant portion does, it reduces the gearing of the, of the new entity. And also it gives the entity a breathing space to pay some of the basic cost of the startup. And, and uh, for example, where it has worked very well uh, so far is in the small manufacturing support program. It's one of our most popular, uh, what to call programs that we, we, we provide, which really speaks to the government's uh, what to call program or, or strategy of import replacement, where we drive local manufacturing by supporting these uh, emerging manufacturers. There we provide Chairperson a loan up to the tune of 15 million, and 20% of that loan is a grant, which is equal to 3 million. And that 3 million makes a huge difference in assisting those SMMEs to, to reduce their gearing and be able to cover some of their basic costs as they start the, the business. So that is how our blended finance is structured. And now, Chair, we're doing further work and research to see, for example, should we be extending blended finance to programs like your Amavulandela, which targets people who run people with disabilities who run businesses, and also to other programs like your 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 your, your microfinance to these rural women, because that is where our major development impact, by the way, Chairperson comes from is through microfinance because there we're able to spread our reach to those people that ordinarily wouldn't have access to finance. So that is how we structure and we plan Chairperson to go forward in structuring our blended finance. And what that does also Chairperson is that the, the reduction of the loan component reduces even the interest that the business will eventually have to pay back as they service the loan because now the loan component would have been reduced by the grant component of that finance, a, a product that we have provided to the SMME. Thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Chair. Perhaps if, uh, also on finance, if you can just clarify the, on, on TREP, um, the, the approvals and the disbursements, uh, where, for example, say Eastern Cape has been approved at 29, uh, but they've dispersed the uh, 16, then what happened to the rest? Uh, so why are they doing this? Thank you, sir. Uh, with TREP, we've, we've restructured TREP, Chairperson, and we'll report when we come back. Yeah. Because TREP was uh, uh, looking at different subsectors within the economy with different thresholds. Some were, for example, sitting at 250,000, with 50,000 being a grant. Some of them would be sitting at 150, 
with a certain percentage being a grant. But what we've take, what the decision that we've taken with the department is that we collapse all the the the, the trap subsectors into one program, that being trap. And within that program, we said the cap is going to be one million, with a, a ten percent of that being a grant, uh, uh, up to a maximum of hundred thousand. Um, um, and then now we're going to because we're implementing that one share in this new financial year, we're going to be measuring the performance of that because what we realize is that when you design these programs, you need to understand the binding constraints of that sector and make sure that the response that you put in place as government responds to the needs of the market, not what we want as government, but what the people on the ground want. For example, we had um, an automotive support program, which was at the time, I think, equivalent to 100,000, 150,000. And the questions were raised. I said, way back in my other life, I used to work for BP funding workshops for the OEMs. And uh, that was like 1999, 2000. To set up a workshop, the hoist that lifts the car at the time used to cost 150,000. So when you give a, a workshop operator 150,000, are you funding them just to buy the, the lift? What about all the other tools that they need to set up the workshop? Mm -hmm. And we realized that the demand on the ground, the reason why the automotive support program couldn't move is because the money that we're providing was nowhere near, not even 1% of what they wanted to set up a workshop. Then when we revised the, the, the track program said, this is now allowing space for these people to come and build up proper workshops with the, with the money that we're providing. And we'll be testing now the response of the market to the increased threshold. The, the issue of approvals, Chairperson, is a, it's a, it's a, it's the nature of the animal. Whether you are, you are a private bank or a development finance institution, you approve a loan and you say to a person, this loan is approved subject. Let's take, for example, a person who gets a contract to, re, to, to repair. There's a client that we got a, a request. He's repairing the, the, the wheels of the transnet wagons. Mm. He's, he applied for, for funding. We said, okay, fine. The loan is approved, but subject to you giving us a contract between yourself and transnet so that we can be able to get the comfort that is not fraudulent. There is indeed an existing appointment between you as an SNM and transnet. We say, we want also to, for you to give us a bank confirmation letter that says, yes, this bank account belongs to company ABCD. Mm -hmm. So the time that the, 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 the client takes to get the confirmation of the appointment with Transnet, mm -hmm. to get the, what to call, the, the bank confirmation letter that this is indeed the bank account of this company, determines how fast then do you disperse. If that person takes two weeks, then you will be able to disperse that money within two weeks. But if they take three months, you can yeah. only disperse in three months time. So it's a nature of the business that we do. There will always be a lag between approvals and disbursements because of those, what we call conditions precedent. Because yeah. the water general is gonna come at the end of the year and say, okay, fine, you disperse this money. Can you prove to me that the money went to the bank account of this particular entity? How mm. can you then confirm that? Can you prove it to me that this person was indeed appointment, appointed by Transnet? give us proof. Yes. So as we do the work, we need to have the, the, the AG in mind that when they come, our tax are in a row, Jefferson. Thank you so much. Back to you, DG. Thanks, Chair. Thanks, CEO. Uh, I'll quickly ask uh, Colin, the executive from CEDA, to talk on the capacity building uh, for small businesses, especially those that benefited from TREP. Colin. Thank you. Thank you, DG. Thank you, colleagues. I think it is important then to just start by saying the mandate of CEDA as per the uh, Small Business Amendment Act is to be an ecosystem facilitator within, you know, the ecosystem. And one of the things that we are trying to do is to demystify competition and um, rather work with, you know, entities that's like-minded to CEDA 
And um, when I had joined, I heard the conversation on enterprise development and the fact that there's, you know, a little bit of a struggle. But what we are saying as CEDA is that we're looking at how do we make sure that we work with, um, you know, entities that's like-minded so that we can then look at not only what CEDA needs to achieve as a mandate, but what our country needs to achieve um, in terms of, you know, poverty alleviation as well as um, unemployment. If I can just look at some of our figures that we uh, were reporting on for quarter four and then for the financial year, specifically on TRIP. So when we look at TRIP, um, and I think the CEO of CIFA had mentioned that you have to look at pre-investment and then, you know, there's an investment happening and then there's post-investment. And CEDA plays quite a critical part within the pre-investment as well as in the post-investment. Um, part of what we do is we do uh, assist entrepreneurs with registration with um, the Commission of Intellectual Property and Companies. We also assist them with the um, SARS tax registration, be it um, pay as you earn, um, companies tax, as well as uh, value added tax. And then we also assist in terms of bank accounts to the opening of banking accounts, business banking accounts, so that we do know that uh, when they do transact with CIFA, um, that they, uh, the monies that will be paid will be paid into a banking account. But on the number of, you know, the trip uh, because there's about seven eight programs that we were looking at um, on the spaza shops in general de dealer supported we assisted 6694 um, spaza shops um, in general if i just look at our uh, outreach in terms of our entrepreneurship awareness sessions we looked at uh, or we assisted 67000 uh, smmes throughout the country we also, when we look at the number of personal care businesses supported, those are the ones that's um, in hair care, you know, they also are doing, it, or it's massage parlors, et cetera. And there we've assisted 2,738 of those uh, entrepreneurs. And this is through training. It could be technical training. It could be, like I said, some of the other things that we have done. But um, there's obviously a continuum of work that we do in terms of making sure that they are ready for finance. And then once they were financed, we will then come back in and then we will assist them with the post investment. We also looked at our number of informal and micro restaurants in Chisanyamas, which we supported. And there we've supported 3,425. And just a disclaimer as well, from a CEDA perspective, these are unaudited numbers. We are um, still going through the audits as we speak. Our number of fruit and vegetable vendors, which we supported, is 4,333 um, that we have supported. A uh, number of panel beaters, our motor mechanics, our auto spares and auto footment business supported um, centers, we have assisted 2,305 of the um, entrepreneurs and SMMEs, that's panel beaters or motor mechanics. Then we also looked at uh, our small scale bakeries and confectionaries, which we've supported. And there we've supported 2,546 of these entrepreneurs with um, non-financial assistance. We also then looked at our clothing, leather and textile businesses, which we've supported. And there we've supported just about 3,651 of them. Butcheries we looked at, and there we've assisted 2,216. And then um, one thing that is quite important to mention as well is um, Seed as a whole was able to, you know, assist in terms of the number of jobs we've, we were able to create and a number of jobs that we've uh, created or that we assisted in creating in the space is 4,865. Um, also, I think I've mentioned in, at the beginning that we cannot do this alone. So that thing of, you know, CEDA alone and not really looking at the entire ecosystem, that is something of the past, especially through the district development model. We want to make sure that people that is, you know, in the space is assisting in terms of getting those numbers. So our uh, SMMEs and cooperatives that was assisted through the ecosystem, we assisted 62,240 of those. I think it is also important just to mention that um, although we're looking at technical training, we look at, um, you know, training of the jockey, which is the person that's really um, driving the business. We also look at how best do we bring in um, certain aspects such as uh, productivity improvement 
or quality assessments that we do wherever they are needed. And therefore, holistically, we look at the business and say that this is how we want to see, you know, a business moving forward with some of the uh, specific interventions that we have. Those are not the only interventions. So although we're speaking of the Township and Rural Entrepreneurship Program, we have different interventions within finance and legal that we assist with. Um, uh, for instance, we look at business registrations, which I spoke about business planning, our financial management, where we look at costing, we look at basic bookkeeping. Um, one of the other things that we have done was we actually uh, procured uh, point of sale devices and those point of sale devices are now being um, distributed to some of our spaza shops that is um, you know, being assisted by CEDA and CIFA. Then we also look at human resource development because it is important that uh, staff gets training as well as mentorship, our skills development planning, as well as uh, I've spoken about productivity and uh, with our quality improvement that I've also spoken about. One of the big, big ones that we also look at is marketing interventions, where we look at, um, you know, packaging. What does the packaging look like for some of these entrepreneurs with that's in the rural areas as well as in townships? And then we assist them to get the packaging better. We assist them with QR coding, um, you know, marketing plans or strategies that they might need, as well as trade exhibitions where um, there might be trade exhibitions where they can go to and display some of the products that they do, um, you know, on maybe a very small scale, we now, we now can assist them to actually accelerate and also scale the business to a bigger business then. Um, DJ, I think that is what I wanted to say just on the uh, TREP program from a CEDA perspective, but it's, it's something that's continually being, um, you know, done. We, we're looking at how do we improve some of the ones that we have. I think the CEO from CIFA already spoke about how the program in itself is changing, and we do want to make sure that every business within the township and not only the ones that we've previously assisted gets assisted through the assistance of CEDA and CIFA so that they are able then to you know contribute meaningfully to the economy thanks DJ. thanks chair uh, thanks colin uh, let me respond to some of the questions um, before minister comes in Maybe I'll start with the chair's questions and, and go back uh, upwards. If I note the structure, chair, I must indicate that uh, there has been some traction uh, in the last uh, few weeks. Um, the portfolio committee did invite DPSA to come through and they came and made a presentation. Uh, we are engaging weekly uh, with the DPSA. Um, we had informally, because the process is the minister has to sign off the final um, structure that she approves and then share it with DPSA for concurrence and, and final approval. So to fast track the process, there was an engagement at a ministerial level. Um, and then the as officials were asked to go and work and make sure that we finalize this as soon as possible. Uh, so we've been engaging weekly documents uh, to and fro. Uh, they've asked for confirmation of the budget, for example, and we've supplied that information. They've analyzed so that it, when minister submits, we don't have a problem where it's deep. Uh, we've lost you now, uh, DG. Uh, DG? Apologies, Chair. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, trying muted. to change. <laughs> Apologies, Chair. Uh, I'm trying to change the connectivity. I think there is a challenge uh, with uh, the Wi-Fi. Uh, oh. Chair, I was saying... We have started with that process. Uh, so there are these weekly engagements between officials from the department as well as officials from TPSA. So we should be submitting within the next two weeks uh, after minister's approval. And then uh, we should be having a structure. Uh, so we are very much positive chair that uh, the issue of the structure will finally be uh, resolved. The, the issue of the National Small Enterprise Act, the advice uh, from DPSA, uh, because whatever entity we establish, we still need to get their 
uh, approval as well as national treasury is that we have to establish this uh, for the first four years, it should be established as a juristic person within the department in the medium term. Uh, then it will become a public entity uh, falling under Shell 3A because it will depend on government funding. Uh, so the startup costs uh, will be have to be reprioritized for the department, the initial ones, and then at some stage it has to be as because it will operate as a juristic person. Uh, it will have to be um, uh, budgeted for uh, separately, like uh, uh, CEDA. CEDA is a Schedule 3A entity, and uh, they do get a deadline item uh, through us uh, from National Treasury. So there is that process that we need to incubate um, the, the entity first before it can be an independent uh, institution. Uh, the Businesses Act, yes, we we put those targets there, but there is a, a push uh, really to make sure that the Businesses Act comes to Parliament as soon as possible. But we are also aware of the, uh, the, the challenges that we are going to face along the way. As I indicated earlier, there was an attempt in 2013 by TTIC and that deal was crushed. Uh, they have just abandoned it uh, in 2013. So we are taking up uh, those issues that were very um, they were raising a lot of emotions from quite a number of people. Others were saying we are just uh, adding red tape uh, with the revision of the act and all those things, but it, it's, it's important that it gets revised. There is some sort of uniformity across uh, the sector. So we are pushing uh, that it gets uh, finalized as soon as possible. Um, we know that we have to consult uh, widely, consult with the provinces, because one of the uh, structures that will be interested in this, that will be affected by whatever changes we make will be the municipalities because they do generate income uh, through these uh, permits uh, that they issue. Some, uh, they charge a lot of money, others, they charge reasonably. Uh, so they, they will, we expect a lot of contestation uh, around uh, this uh, bill. That's why we are realistic in terms of, of the timelines, but there is a commitment. The minister is uh, also clear that we need to move uh, with the Businesses Act as soon as possible, but we hope we'll also get assistance uh, from parliament side when it comes to parliament uh, to make sure that it gets done as, as, as soon as, as possible. Issue of red tape, Chair, it's an issue that we have raised and it gets raised in various uh, 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 structures. One of the issues that uh, we have tried or we are trying to do from our side in terms of what can we do to increase support through CEDA, for example, we are targeting to establish an additional 80 uh, uh, access points so that these, they complement the work that is done uh, uh, by CEDA but also the work that is done by, by the municipalities. We know that in some areas, we are talking to municipalities just to avail a space uh, so that we can establish this service point for CEDA uh, so that we can reach as many small businesses as, as possible, but also believe that this will also empower uh, the local municipalities uh, to have people who are dedicated in supporting small businesses, but also they can get guidance you know, from the CEDA uh, officials uh, who will be located in this area. In some instances, we know that we are not going to have CEDA officials because we can't uh, expand the budget, especially when it comes to getting more employees. Uh, so we'll have to train the local people to assist us in dealing or in providing this, the, the support uh, to, 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 to small businesses and cooperatives. Um, in terms of the allocation for now for YCF, uh, what we are doing, Chair, because we, we said we cannot just sit and say uh, until Treasury allocates funding, let's look at the existing uh, budget and take that 30% and reallocate it to Youth Challenge Fund so that there is money that is being spent. So even on TREP, uh, the blended finance, all these programs that we have, we said 30% of it at least must be set aside for funding young people. For now, the only money that is a, a straight allocation is the money that was reprioritized from Gazelles, uh, which is 29 million for this year, and it, 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 it increases over the MTF. And then um, the other questions uh, that we were asked, um, uh, Honorable Moshodi, the, the issue of the reduction of red tape, Chair, I must indicate that uh, it has not been moved to DPME. 
the champion that is at the presidency, uh, they are working closely. They've already met with the minister to introduce themselves uh, because they are aware that to the east work that we are doing, we had presented in terms of what we are doing as a department, but also um, they participated in the interprovincial red tape reduction task team meeting where they sat with us and also in the, engaged with the province just to understand because they need to understand what is being done by various provinces but also to identify those five critical areas uh, that we can uh, uh, deliver on as, as per the discussions between the office and the minister. So there is that process that is ongoing. The provinces have been have submitted some of the information in terms of the critical areas around red tape uh, because we cannot sit here in Pretoria and, and assume that we know what is happening in each and every province. So there is that working relationship between ourselves and the a red tape reduction office because the, the, the location of that unit is very critical because there are things that we recommend uh, to various government departments that affect SMMEs negatively, but it's up to them to uh, implement those uh, recommendations. Uh, we, we don't have any lever. So the location of a person at the presidency is very critical because they will be able to direct uh, departments to uh, amend certain uh, 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 policies if they have to, uh, so that uh, the tape is reduced. Chair, on the issue of the contribution of SMEs to distant employment, we do have um, a target uh, we can come through to the uh, uh, committee just to present in terms of what we've uh, discovered in terms of the contribution because the user we utilize for now the information that is available for example the in income tax their contribution when it comes to the the company's uh, income tax uh, the, the, the we look at their contribution when it comes to uh, the turnover and all those things so we do have a, a complete presentation where we can come through uh, to the committee and, and make a, con a, a presentation on how uh, SMMEs uh, over the years, they have been contributing uh, to, to employment as well as uh, economic growth. Um, Chair, on the uh, challenges due to capacity constraints, um, especially under Program 1, one issue that we normally raise is that it doesn't matter how big the department or the size of the department, we are still expected uh, to uh, comply uh, with certain provisions. For example, you uh, under finance, uh, you, you need to have two people, one dealing with management accounts. Um, uh, we need another person, you know, dealing with uh, financial administration. So those things, uh, it, it doesn't matter. You still need to have proper capacity because there's also a delegation of, of, of duties or separation of duties uh, within uh, those uh, areas. But with the uh, revised uh, structure that we are engaging with National Treasury on, uh, we, 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 we are addressing those matters. Uh, for example, we never had you know, an internal control function. It's located somewhere. Someone is delivering on that uh, service uh, within the department. So there is really that um, uh, feeling from some officials that a lot is expected of them, uh, whereas they, they, those activities uh, can be delivered uh, with uh, the appropriate capacity. So we are including the issue of the capacity uh, in the issue of uh, in the structure that is being revised and submitted uh, to DPSA. But we are always conscious, uh, Chair, that uh, government does not sit uh, with deep pockets. Uh, we need to be very thin and uh, efficient in terms of what we put across as a structure. Chair, in terms of the questions raised by uh, uh, Honorable Moima, the there are quite a number of lessons learned. I think uh, Minister will also uh, cover this, uh, but there's quite a, an interesting uh, um, you know, thread that we are getting across, is that some of the issues really are issues that are around capacity building, uh, but also issue of accessibility. That's why we are responding through CEDA in establishing more uh, contact points so that people can access because some of them were complaining about the accessibility of these offices because some of them are, open, are, are located in urban areas. So there is really good lessons that we are learning and we are already responding uh, to these matters that are being raised uh, by, by, by SMMEs in the interactions that we've had uh, through the DDM uh, interactions, but also uh, all the, 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 the the engagements we end uh, with uh, uh, the dialogue where we also bring in the private sector because uh, it, it doesn't help when SMEs are only looking at government. They come, the private sector guys, they come and present the opportunities 
uh, from their side so that as government we can also come in and support uh, them with capacity so that they can be able to take advantage of these uh, supply development opportunities uh, in particular. The issue of uh, duplication of activities, but also having other entities assuming the mandate, especially of CEDA. CEDA is, is, is operating at national, and there's, um, when we started with the process of incorporating CIFA and CBDA into CEDA, at some stage, DPSA was saying we must also incorporate all these other entities at provincial level uh, into, into this, uh, pro they must be part of this process, but we're realistic in terms of what is possible for now. Um, for now, we just need to get this CIFA and CBDA incorporated into CEDA, and then we can then, as a process, because it, a lot of things can go wrong if you try to do everything at the same time, because we also do not want, want to disturb uh, the way things are happening, you know, in the in the system, because if you take all entities and try and integrate them, you, you can really create chaos at, 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 at the end of the day. So it's important for us that we address this. Um, we do have structures chaired through MinMEC. There is a joint MinMEC uh, that is led by um, a, a Department of Tourism where we participate in. Uh, also, we participate together with Department of Trade and Industry where we also share our plans uh, with uh, the, the, the the various uh, uh, provinces. Minister has met with uh, almost all the MECs. There is one, I think, that is uh, we have not met with, but where we also present our plans uh, to them so that they can know what we are doing as it assists them to align uh, 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 our programs at the national as well as the provincial uh, department. Um, the ease of doing business, uh, I think I've covered that, but it's a very critical area because some of the interventions, Chair, that we have as a department, we are limited in terms of the resources. Uh, the money that we, 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 we have, uh, that we disperse through uh, a CIFA, for example, uh, covering over 80,000, is quite a lot in terms of the numbers, but we know that we have over... 2.5 million SMMEs, we cannot reach all of them. But when it comes to the interventions on the uh, uh, red tape reduction, uh, on the legislation, we are able to impact a number of SMEs, even those that are not getting that direct support uh, from us. That's why we've elevated uh, the work that we are doing around the space. The, the, these two bills uh, that we are busy with, even the review of all legislation, uh, we believe that if we can do this, this will have a bigger impact in terms of uh, impacting the whole uh, ecosystem rather than impacting those that are able to access both our financial as well as non-financial support. So Chair, we are serious about this work that we are doing uh, in, 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 in this area. Uh, we're also aware that 90% uh, uh, of the 11 million jobs uh, that are supposed to be created are supposed to come from SMMEs as well as expanding businesses as per the NDP target. But I think there are quite a number of areas that have uh, also disturbed our plans as government. Uh, the issue of COVID has disturbed us. Uh, the economic uh, challenges that we are facing, even the, the disruptions that happened uh, in, in July last year, it really disturbed us now, the, 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 the crisis that we face now, uh, the floods in KZN, because we have to redirect support, as the CEO was saying, to, to, to these uh, agent uh, 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 interventions. So they have been along the way disturbed by these, or interrupted in our plans by all these uh, activities where we are expected to respond as a department of small business development, but working in partnership with others. So there will be those things, I'm sure, uh, the, and the National Planning Commission has done some review and they've made some recommendations um, on what we need to do uh, in certain areas, but the programs that are introduced also by government, including the Economic Reconstruction and Recovery Plan, is also trying to make sure that uh, we are able to recover as an economy. I think I've spoken to the issue of the red table for the questions from Honorable Boshoff in terms of the establishment of the red tape unit in the presidency, that they are playing that very important role uh, where they are able to take our recommendations forward uh, because we cannot go around and tell uh, other government departments what to do. We can always make recommendations and persuade them, but uh, the discussions in terms of directing uh, specific uh, departments to do certain things can come from presidents. I'm sure we've seen some successes with the Fulintela. 
uh, interventions where some uh, uh, there were presentations last week where we've seen significant progress in terms of their interventions. Informal businesses, definitely we, 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 like we indicated, we do have specific schemes that talks to informal businesses. But the, as, as, as government, uh, when uh, COVID struck, uh, we did come up with quite a number of interventions to support informal businesses in particular. We also even introduced the suspension of the payment of license fees uh, from municipalities. I must indicate that the compliance uh, was a concern. Some, some, some um, uh, municipalities ignored us. Uh, we did raise the issues with them. I think the city of Cape Town was one of the municipalities where we had some challenges with them complying with that. But this year they started, uh, I think they implemented it in January because we had said, we are not saying do away with the issue of permits. You still need to have permits so that your businesses can be located in the right areas. But we're saying, can you suspend the requirement for the payment of the fee because informal businesses have been affected by COVID. Most of them were not operating and they were not also getting the consumers that they used to get. So they, they, we do have uh, these interventions, but our Businesses Act as well is, is aimed at, at supporting informal businesses, ensuring that we are able to get um, uh, these issues uniform across the country, the issue of the fees, uh, because that's one of the biggest issues that has been raised by informal businesses, that these uh, permits are very expensive, and you find that it's mostly people who have lost jobs who are starting informal businesses. So how well do you expect them to pay 5,000 rent just to get a permit? So this is the intervention that we are pushing through uh, the businesses. Uh, lastly, on the informal businesses, also the infrastructure that we are setting up, um, the, it's targeting informal businesses because we want to create that conducive environment for them to operate uh, the shared economic infrastructure facility where we are partnering both with the private sector as well as municipalities to provide uh, these facilities. Okay, we've been affected, uh, maybe CFO will expand on this one, with the advisory, they call it an advisory note uh, from Treasury, uh, because we had to halt uh, any new tenders from the 16th of uh, February, so we did not proceed with the issuing of, of, of new tenders. We had to apply for an exemption to proceed with certain procurement, and we did uh, that. It took a little bit long, but they have responded to us and gave us a go-ahead because it was also restricting us in terms of even getting GTEC uh, to come and support us with the incorporation of C. Uh, CIFA and CBDA into CIFA. So they've given us a go ahead. Last week we did get that. So we are proceeding uh, with uh, those tenders that we have been uh, exempted, but also amending our own uh, uh, procurement uh, policies so that we are not found wanting uh, uh, because of the suspension of the triple PFA. Chair, I think it's it, it, the issue of oversight. I think it's the the right of the of the committee. They can conduct oversight on the on the enterprises that have been supported, um, and I think uh, the the possibility of getting those reports uh, it's something that is possible. But I must indicate that in the six months might be too short uh, because other businesses you you get approval, as the CEO was saying, it, it can take a little bit of time for them to finalize all the the, the the, the, the compliance requirements before the money is dispersed to them and then they have to go and procure the equipment that they need. So you might not really get uh, the impact within a six months period, but uh, I think the committee uh, can, can do the oversight uh, uh, because it's part of, of, of the mandate of the committee. So it might take, it might assist to give them a little bit more time uh, for them to, to start operating and uh, generating income so that we can be able to say when your project or your business was approved, this is where you, you were, these are many people you have, you were employing at that time. And then now after a period of a year or so, now you are able to generate more revenue, you've added more people. And I think that that will, will, will assist. Um, CEO covered uh, the questions by Honorable Dango, but the performance audit, uh, definitely we're going to be, the AJ has started uh, with the performance audit and they will be uh, 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 deal dealing with this work and, and presenting it uh, to Parliament. Uh, we can, we can uh, share the details of the district champions. Um, we don't have a problem with that. Involvement with the Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement, the minister is in the process of um, uh, having or hosting an SMME, Africa SMME conference. 
uh, we do have the support of the African Development Bank because we also want to look at the opportunities across the African continent, especially for SMMEs. We don't want them to miss out uh, on this Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement. So there will be that conference which involves uh, small businesses and, and ministers across uh, the African continent, but we'll also be prioritizing the biggest economies so that we can share opportunities, share you know, the, 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 the value chains, you know, because some of the things that we are procuring uh, from Europe, from Asia, some of the things we can get them from uh, our our sister countries uh, in the in the in the African continent. So there will be that uh, engagement further because we really don't want to miss out uh, on 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 this opportunity. Chair, lastly, on the uh, some question that were raised by Honourable Long, uh, some uh, I might not uh, be able to answer, but um, we because some I think they are political. In nature, but the the money that we are dispersing, uh, I think there was a question of whether we, are we following the money. Um, yes, that's what we are uh, doing. We have not been doing it uh, efficiently in the past few years because there were some monies that were sitting with the department. So we were focusing on the money that was dispersed by the department. But since now we've clarified this and make sure that every um, resource, especially the money that is. Uh, targeted towards supporting uh, SMMEs and cooperatives, individual businesses, goes to CIFA. It would be, it puts us in a position as a department to be able to uh, oversee this, go follow up and make sure that the money does get to businesses and it does make an impact in terms of uh, uh, supporting those businesses. Um, in instances uh, where, for example, there is a target chair that is on the, on the, on the, on the uh, APP, where we want to evaluate the incubation uh, support program. We we'll see that in, in terms of the budget, significant amount of money that is allocated to CEDA goes to incubation support, and we are ex planning to expand uh, these incubators across the country. And it's important for us as a, as a department to follow the money. Uh, it's important for us, I think, to also increase the warm bodies uh, because we are expected to comply um like any other government department so having fewer people does not assist us as a department because demands are as high as uh, those that are placed on bigger departments so we we do have that responsibility to make sure that we do have capacity from our side one of the additions for example uh, in this structure we want to get these uh, sector specialists who can assist us uh, to identify and scrutinize all these opportunities across all these uh, master plans, but also look at uh, what interventions should we come up with as a department to make sure that SMMEs uh, do benefit uh, from all these master plans. So there is a need for us to get that, those specific uh, skills that will assist us uh, to serve a small business inspector. Uh, I think, Chair, I've tried to cover everything. Um, if I've not covered, uh, I, will, I, will, I, will, I will cover. Uh, before I, I hand over back to you, Chair. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, uh, DG, uh, for the responses, and also to the CEO and uh, other managers of uh, uh, CEDA. Uh, over to you, uh, Minister. And if you can also uh, make uh, closing remarks, because uh, we are approaching the uh, 1,300 hours. Uh, we we'll then allow members uh, to have a break, and then we will we're going to have a plenary session this afternoon. Thank you so much once more, Honourable um, Chaperson, with with your collective Chaperson. The team has really responded to the questions that were asked, and of course, mine is to just emphasize the need for support from this from this select committee in terms of the funds that we keep on requesting. We all agree that the gap is too huge in the market in terms of SMME funding. But at the same time, we are appreciative of the challenges that we face internally as the portfolio, which is why the first thing is to make sure that we attend to those and forge partnerships that can help us to be able to deliver as per the expectations whilst we are advocating for more funding. Uh, DJ, I think one thing that we did not respond to is the issue of the list of, them, of the champions 
uh, of the various provinces. I, I unless I miss that, I know there's a. No, you said you're going to make them available. Uh, minute, uh, it did uh, okay. respond. Thank you so much. And this again is meant to, to ensure that there's alignment because what we are trying to do as the portfolio is to shift away from interventions that just come from national without looking at what the provincial and local economic development plans talk to. Because if you look, for example, at the kind of support that we, we are providing, let me talk about um, the spaza shops. We are providing 15,000 rents for spaza shops, of which 10.5 is grant and 4.5 is loan. And when you go to a province like Gauteng, already in their plan and budgeting, they provide 50,000 rents as a grant to a small business. Now, these are the inadequacies that we're talking about. What kind of support is required or how do we build on each other's capability to make sure that we can really look at impactful interventions. If you go to the Eastern Cape, just a local municipality in one of the rural areas uh, in Musa, they, they, they provide 100,000 rands because they're looking at what the honorable members are also talking to in terms of the infrastructure and the safety that must be provided to informal traders now. So the, the engagements that we are having both with the MSCs of economic development throughout the country. And we've, we are now busy with the road shows, uh, only two provinces that are left. Help us to say, how do we align our, our, our resources and plans so that when we come in, we come in to complement the work that has already been done by the province instead of the same informal traders or spaza shops or small businesses that will go to a province and get different criteria that is set up for them to qualify for funding and it's a different amount. But we're talking about people who are involved in the same trade. So that standardization of saying at least the minimum, the bare minimum of the support that we're talking about should be understood by all at different levels. And also the alignment in terms of the energy strategies, the provincial growth and development plans and our interventions talking to the economic recovery and reconstruction plan must really help us to say, does this ecosystem really work meaningfully for us as the country? If it's not working, where are the gaps? As the DG outlined that, for example, just on payment of, 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 of permit fees, it's something that is different. Of course, we understand the grading by the municipalities, but we're talking about small business. It doesn't cease to be a small business because it's an at advanced uh, city. And this is where we are saying, there's a need as we work with Ms. Dengosi to ensure that we identify certain things that are bottlenecks, whilst we also try to introduce new incentives. Honorable Chair, you know that if a big business is coming to invest in a particular province, everybody runs up and down to say, what can we do to make sure that they keep the investment? And this is what is lacking when we talk about the small businesses and the engagements, therefore, that we are having with our sister uh, departments and the private sector look at that to say, now that we have failed to create the jobs that we're supposed to create because of poor investment to our small businesses, what is that we can do? Not only to fast track creation of jobs, but to also ensure that we give a maximum participation in the economy by the small businesses. At the center of it again is unbundling both the value and supply chain components to say where are the areas because there's too much concentration on certain areas, especially those that are advanced. If you, you know you are a village, I don't even have to, to say if you are coming from a, a rural province, you would know. The people that need toilets, the people that need electricity, the people that need school infrastructure are the rural provinces. But what benefit goes to the small businesses in those areas, which, which is what also informed us in terms of changing the amount that we had on the township and rural enterprise uh, program to say 350,000, yes, it's okay, but there's more work that needs to be done and an opportunity that can be presented, especially as we build on what Minister Patel talks about as one of the critical drivers of the economic recovery and reconstruction plan, localization. If you're going to focus on localization, it means we shouldn't really be looking at people who must come and therefore make the township and rural SMMEs to, to just be consumers of those services, but let them be entrepreneurs that can drive development 
whilst helping those big companies uh, that are coming out of South Africa to be able to get the products that they need at a reasonable price. And all of this requires us and the legislative environment. Yes, like you, person, we are concerned about the timelines in terms of the legislative framework. We are not happy. Uh, the red tape, as you are aware, it's a SONA commitment which means it's an annual commitment out of what has already been identified. Now we'd be very happy if we were to get the select committee agreeing with the portfolio committee on the other side to say, if you prioritize these ones, we can reduce our program in terms of other things because we understand the importance of having these legislations in place so that we can work hand in hand and ensure that we don't have to take 18 months because by the time we go to 18 months, small business would have died. You really delay. That is why we find ourselves here now. Now, if we're going to give ourselves two years or three years, we will not have any small business. And these people, as we have seen with the unrest that we have seen, would have risen up against any government, irrespective of who's leading it. Because it's about the exclusion in their own economy. So all the efforts that we're talking about are efforts that are saying, how do we bring the critical stakeholders in the ecosystem, the legislative environment, the financiers, the SMMEs themselves, the communities themselves to say, can we fast track because we all agree, there's a need for us to grow jobs. There's, I mean, to create jobs, there's a need for us to grow, to grow the economy. And that cannot be done by a single department or by government alone. Let me just pause there. And we do and uh, continue to engage with National Treasury. I want to emphasize that uh, in terms of the needs that are required for the department whilst we're trying to address um, the gaps that we have. We also appreciative of the fact that for certain services we'll have to outsource in the meantime, because as I said, some of the things can really be fast tracked when looking at the internal capability, but we really have to source out some skills and make sure that we can create some special papers vehicles that must help us deliver on what needs to be delivered. I wanted to just talk to those and the honorable members, yes, they are allowed to go and provide the oversight. We will, of course, looking at the POPIA Act, which is something that we're gonna be addressing honorable members to say, if you're gonna access support from our, our portfolio, whether through CEDA or ourselves or CIFA, now you must know that it's a requirement because we can't continue coming here to report that we spend so much on so many SMMs and all of them you don't know because we are scared of poppy, yet there's something wrong with that. If people do not want then to be evidence that indeed these are the people that we have supported, they would have to go to the banks to remain um, anonymous or whoever that they wanna be. But with us, what is public funds that we account for. In order to give comfort even to the legislators, they ought to be able to say we're visiting a stellar funded company and indeed they can match the value versus what amount that we have put there. Thank you so much, person. Let me pause there for now. And I thank you for giving us this opportunity. And we apologize for any inconveniences that we have caused that led to you having to, to postpone the meeting. Thank you very much, uh, uh, Mafak and uh, the ministry and the department and the entities uh, for coming and presenting the APPs and the budget. We really appreciate. Uh, and, but also with regard to the legislation, uh, we as a NCOP, uh, particularly this committee, we, we prioritize legislation. I can tell you that in November, the Department of Employment and Labor uh, brought uh, two bills, uh, occupational health and, I mean, occupational and injuries uh, compensation bill, as well as the Employment uh, Equity Amendment Bill in November. Today, we are tabling those two bills uh, this afternoon uh, in the House uh, for it to be considered passed or rejected. It depends. Uh, so I'm trying to explain. But if we didn't have December, perhaps we would have uh, uh, considered it uh, perhaps last month. Uh, but then we had to take a break in December. Uh, so as soon as you bring it, uh, uh, will definitely uh, pass it within a year uh, or even six months. <laughs> so we promise you that uh, we, we prioritize legislation. As such, we don't have any legislation uh, from any department in front of us as we speak now. These were the last two. Uh, so we are ready uh, for any legislation that is going to come to 
this committee. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, thank you to, uh, to you and the department. And also thanks uh, honorable members for coming uh, and uh, your participation. Uh, we will meet with the uh, minister or deputy minister uh, on the 24th. Uh, the data has been confirmed for the budget for debate. Uh, is the 24th. So next week we'll be debating the, uh, this APP and the budget. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Minister. But we'll see CETA and CIFA uh, in August uh, on the issues that we had uh, initially wanted to meet with them on. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you, your attendance and participation. Thank you very much, uh, honorable members uh, and the staff of the committee, the staff of parliament. Uh, in general, uh, the media and everybody else. Thank you so much. Uh, the meeting is adjourned. Thank you. Thank you.